I want to start off by letting you know what I really like about you, uh, and that is how out there you are with who you are. You don't seem to hide behind an academic detachment, and I respect you mm -hmm. for that. I think that's a big deal. It's uh, it's unavoidable uh, to me. <laughs> that's the best I can tell you. It's not something I thought up. Uh, it's just the way it is. I can't be any different. Yeah, when you think something is baloney, you say so. I mean, you even write a book about it. It, it, which is not, which is not to say that in my normal life I am so brutally honest uh, with people around me, and I, I I have a minimum of so of social skills I think, uh, but when it comes to these discussions, it's it's very close to my heart. So um, it comes very naturally to me as well when people put forward ideas that I think uh, are self-evidently wrong, uh, it's unavoidable for me to just say it. Uh, and I say it, this is nonsense. And, and let me explain why I think it's uh, uh, nonsense. So it, it may come across as, um, I missed the word now again, and they, 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 there are people in academia who call me the, it's not the angry philosopher, it's something less, <laughs> Uh, less offensive than that, but it's something in that direction. Um, so that, that's where it comes from. I am, I, I feel very passionately committed to the subject, uh, to the idea, to the ideas that are being exchanged and discussed and argued for, because I think um, philosophy is central to human life. Uh, and, and I think maybe arrogantly that people who do not think like me that philosophy is central, are just estranged from themselves uh, and, and from life. I think philosophy is the primary human activity in a sense, since we've managed to extricate ourselves from you know, the, the normal pressures of having to find uh, food, shelter. I mean, we still fight that, most of us still fight that, but at another level, not in that natural level where we used to be. One more time, this thing about being estranged from ourselves and life. What was that? What did you say there? I think, well, I, I, I believe to observe around me that um, some people are very distracted with um, insignificant and banal stuff, like uh, whether they have the latest pair of shoes, uh, um, um, and even the fun they have tends to be more a distraction than a fulfillment uh, activity. And, and when you are in that mode of trying to distract yourself out of the realization of our phenomenal condition as living beings on this planet that have to constantly fight the second law of thermodynamics to stay alive and who are, who are guaranteed to eventually lose that fight, um, I mean, it, it, these are tremendous thoughts and, 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 and they are just an appreciation of the real, of the reality of our situation. Uh, and that is philosophy, but I see a lot of people around who make their very best to distract themselves from, from these questions, these, these observations, this reality. This is part of what I like so much about you. you. You seem to be a truth seeker through and through. The question of the truth of our lives, <clears throat> excuse me, seems to be really central to who you are. Very much. And uh, well, I, I think I end up seeking the truth, but m my commitment is not to the seeking. My commitment is to, is to truth ultimately, which is not to say that I think we, you know, monkeys evolved on planet earth can e ever truly cognize every salient aspect of the truth. I don't think we can, I don't think we have, any reason to believe that our cognitive apparatus has evolved to get to that point. Um, but I think what we owe to ourselves and, and to the rest of the planet and each other is to be honest about our best guesses regarding the truth. Mm. Um, if we already know enough to know that a certain narrative about the truth is flawed, fatally flawed, we owe it to ourselves, to each other, and to the planet to move away from that narrative and towards a better narrative, which will not be the absolute expression of the ultimate truth, uh, but it will be closer to it. So I, I, that is ultimately my commitment. I, I, I feel through every uh, 
pore in my skin, every 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 artery in my body, that um, self-deception is not fine. Uh, uh, and we are masters at, at self-deception. I mean, that materialism or mainstream physicalism is the main narrative about the nature of reality today, despite everything we know regarding the, 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 the failed argument behind it, regarding the empirical evidence that contradicts it. And I'm not talking about anything paranormal. I'm talking about evidence from laboratories. Uh, uh, despite all that, it's still the mainstream narrative. I think this is irresponsible. This is, uh, this is not acceptable. We can do better than this. We know better than this. And we owe it to ourselves, to each other, and to the planet to be responsible and acknowledge that, uh, that we need to take a step forward, or at least a step away from what we already know is wrong. Yeah, you, you make my heart sing. There's something very, you have some kind of integrity that really moves me. Um, and what you just said, said there um, makes me wonder, if you don't mind, how did how did materialism or physicalism how did it how did it get underneath your skin? Well, uh, there was a phase in my life in which I sort of was a physicalist, but not because I thought it through, just because the entire world around me uh, sort of took that for granted. Mm. So I was a, an unthinking materialist. I was a materialist because I didn't think it through. I just sort of, yeah, okay, then that's that's the rule of the game where I am right now. And I didn't give it much thought because I was busy with other things. I was working at CERN uh, in Switzerland, uh, which is sort of, you know, the, the church of physics, not necessarily the church of physicalism, but the church of physics. And, um, and I was having loads of fun. I was completely absorbed in my work. And um, so physicalism or materialism was just the environment where, where I was in. And the, the moment when it started getting under my skin, as you put it, uh, was when I started thinking it through. And, um, you know, I, I, I have two widely different uh, educations. I have education in the humanities and education in the in the hard sciences. Uh, in the hard sciences, uh, I have a PhD in uh, computer engineering and I used to work on AI, artificial intelligence. And in my late 20s, I was doing work on that. And of course, when you're building something that is supposed to be intelligent, uh, uh, you're very close to asking, well, if it's intelligent, is it also conscious? And if it's not, why is it not? Or what do I need to do to make it conscious? And asking these questions, of course, means asking about the foundations of materialism, of physicalism, uh, which, which states that arrangements of matter somehow give rise to, to conscious experience. And, and then I began to think it through. And very quickly, after you begin to think it through deeply with your hands on it, not purely conceptually, but almost from an engineering perspective, mm. uh, very quickly, it, you realize that this makes absolutely no sense. It's a malformed hypothesis. Uh, it doesn't even require empirical evidence to be dismissed because it's internally contradictory and it does not have explanatory power. It doesn't explain anything in that it doesn't explain experience and experience is all we have. Um, so that's when it happened. Just brilliant. Wow. I think you said somewhere that you spent 10 years really thinking hard about this. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. From my mid twenties to my mid thirties, um, I was um, trying to find an alternative for myself. I was not thinking about writing a book, but you see, we, we are story centered beings. We need a narrative in terms of which to relate to ourselves, to each other and the world. Um, and once the physicalist narrative for me was, okay, now it's off the table, you know, I cannot, if I am on, honest to myself, to logic, to reason and to evidence, I simply cannot take this seriously, um, then I landed in a vacuum of narratives and for a human being to not have a story in terms of which to relate to the world is, is, is not acceptable, it's not, it's not a stable point. Um, you immediately start looking for an alternative narrative. And I did that for years. Uh, I think I landed on idealism rather quickly mm. because it, you know, it's, it doesn't require much elaborate thinking. <laughs> you know, basic reasoning is enough to, to indicate the direction. Um, but um, had, having had the experience that I had just had with materialism, I didn't want to commit to that alternative very quickly. I thought, I know I need to close this story 
I need to really stand on firm ground before I really commit myself to this. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did for 10 years. So only at a point in my mid thirties, when I thought, okay, now, now I am on solid ground. I feel pretty confident about this. Then I started the writing and publishing came even later than that. Wow. And, and Schopenhauer was influential, right? He had a role in his thinking had a role in, in how you arrived to your positions. Not at that time. No, I didn't. I was not aware of Schopenhauer uh, at that time. Uh, I think um, the scholar who influenced me most from the very beginning was Carl Jung, oh, who yeah. I had read in my in my teens. Uh, so I think Jungian thought was in the back of my mind throughout, even if I wouldn't have, maybe I wouldn't be able to report that to you back then. I wouldn't have known it explicitly myself, but I think it was in the back of my mind all the time. Schopenhauer came later. And Schopenhauer was a sort of a confirmation. After I wrote The Idea of the World, you know, which was my seventh book in which I made the, I think the most uh, uh, solid uh, case for, for idealism from a post-enlightenment perspective, you know, in other words, based purely on explicit reasoning and, and laboratory evidence, after that, I sort of felt relaxed, like, okay, I did the core of the job I was supposed to do. This, uh, the, the idea of the world is a sort of completion. Um, and then I started reading more leisurely, and then I came across Schopenhauer, and lo and behold, everything he said matched with what I was thinking and had, had written about, um, except that uh, he went deeper. He went more into the implications, in, into what it all meant, for life, uh, he went almost into a sort of self-help about how, how to leverage that understanding to to reduce sadness, to to reduce um, suffering, and uh, and I thought that was phenomenal. And then the other thing that I immediately realized was how misunderstood and mis misrepresented Schopenhauer was in academia, and 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 I, and I was scandalized uh, by that. It was actually this second this latter part that motivated me to go and write a book about Schopenhauer. Which I've been reading and really enjoying. Um, you, you brought up suffering and that uh, Schopenhauer, you saw sort of a self-help component. So I'm very concerned about helping people alleviate neurotic suffering. And the way, the way that I do that is to help people look underneath the hood and face emotions and psychological conflicts that are customarily swept underneath the rug. Part of what I'm hoping for today with you is that we can look at the intersection of mental health and philosophy, or philosophizing for that matter. Um, sure. I'm, I'm particularly interested in the implication of your ontology when it comes to what drives suffering and what alleviates it. Have you spoken to it, but are you able to, to elaborate on that? Sure. Um, I, I give a lot of thoughts to this because and I'm a human being too, and I suffer too. <laughs> um, as you alluded to, some of our suffering uh, is because of things in ourselves that we don't recognize, that we don't, uh, to speak a technical term, uh, we don't metacognize things that we experience, but we don't know that we experience. We don't tell ourselves or acknowledge to ourselves, I am experiencing this shame, or I am experiencing this regret, or I am experiencing this trauma, or I am experiencing this fear or anxiety. We don't tell ourselves, uh, let alone another, uh, that we have these things in us because we don't want to recognize them. We have this naive idea that, uh, if, that we can wish away the bad parts of our feelings. And I think that's when it all goes wrong. When Jung wrote extensively about this, uh, if you deny parts of yourself, it comes back as symptoms. So you will develop, you know, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and then that something will happen. What you regret will come back and bite you on the rear end and it will be worse than if you could develop a relationship with it explicitly. Another point of suffering, I think, is rumination. And, 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 and that has to do with our ability to self-reflect. And by by ruminating, you know, by telling ourselves constantly a particular story about what the past should have been and what the future might be, uh, we sort of feed our regret and depression on the one hand and feed our anxiety on the other, on the other hand. Um, and I think uh, both things, 
to be solved, to be truly, well, solved, to be truly integrated and be rendered less harmful require a, a philosophical perspective because they are both related to meaning. And, uh, and a psychotherapist, and I'm, I'm sure you, you, you have given what I'm about to say a lot, a lot of thought yourself, even if you didn't arrive at the same conclusions. Um, what happens in, in, in a therapy room is largely a search for meaning. Because as Viktor Frankl said in the 20th century, you know, it, the will to meaning is the ultimate will. It's higher and above Freud's will to pleasure or, or, or Nietzsche's will to power. Um, the will to meaning is, is the ultimate. It, it is the ultimate, not a panacea, but it, it, it is the holy grail of psychology. If you can find meaning in what you are going through, you integrate it in your life. You sort of develop a mature relationship with it. You don't necessarily st stop pain, but you stop rum ruminating suffering. Um, but meaning is not something that the therapist can, can just have the patient give to the world because it becomes a form of explicit self-deception. You know, uh, we cannot project meaning onto the world and expect that that will be healing because it, it, it's, you, we are conjuring up the meaning and then trying to believe that it's real. I mean, it doesn't work for the meaning move, which is the ultimate move to, to really be effective, I think it has to be grounded on a, I'm going to use the word belief, but it has to be grounded on a, on a belief that is substantiated. In other words, we have to see that life and the world have intrinsic meaning in and of themselves, and not only the meaning we want to project onto them, the latter is a form of self-deception. The former is a reality. If we see that reality, the reality of the intrinsic inherent meaning of, in the world, in every event of our lives, and, and in our very lives, if we see that intrinsic real meaning, then the therapist can perform the alchemy that uh, he or she is expected to perform. Um, and in, in that sense, I think psychology and philosophy, particularly metaphysics, are joined at the rib. Uh, uh, psychology, in fact, is a product of philosophy. They were not separated. The 20th century separated them artificially because our philosophy went down a path that the psychologists couldn't follow because it was a nihilistic path. So we psychologists had to use a Caesar and, and cut the connection because otherwise they would be dragged down to hell with our metaphysics, which was Going, going to hell and now has landed in hell. Um, but if our metaphysics finds its path back, I think we'll be in a position to be able to re-acknowledge that psychology and philosophy are intrinsically joined at the hip and it will be okay to acknowledge that again. Wow, wow, wow. The divorce between the two, are you at all referring to Freud sort of distancing himself from Nietzsche and not, not acknowledging his influence? Is that... The, the, one example, that's just one example. Even Jung, to whom I have probably the greatest respect, uh, uh, he often tried to separate what he was saying from philosophy quite explicitly. He, he, he would explicitly say, I am a scientist, I am not a philosopher. Uh, and then other times he would say precisely the opposite. Towards the end of his life, he would acknowledge he, he, he had done philosophy all the way along. But in his earlier days, when he was professionally active, he explicitly tried to distance himself. And, and, and the reason they did that was several fold. Um, in the case of Freud, who was a physicalist, he didn't have to divorce himself from philosophy because philosophy was uh, physicalist because he himself was. And his whole psychology was to some extent a bit nihilistic. Uh, um, but he distanced himself from philosophy because philosophy itself was becoming associated with uh, unsubstantiated speculation, uh, which is of course not what analytic philosophy is today. Uh, it's not uh, uh, even what philosophy arguably was in the time of Freud. We already had William James, for instance, uh, and Schopenhauer uh, who were not doing unsubstantiated philosophy. They were both grounded in science. 
Um, but uh, th there is this notion that philosophy is unsubstantiated speculation more akin to theology than to science because it was a, an echo of the late Middle Ages with scholasticism and scholastic philosophy was a type of philosophy that already started from the conclusions, the conclusions of the scriptures and, which, and then tried, tried to find a substantiation to, to, to justify those conclusions. And that's not how philosophy is done. You don't start from the conclusions, you start from data and then you derive a conclusion from that. So this link in the West um, by the time of Freud was already over 500 years old, and it was very strong. Uh, even though scholastic philosophy was not nihilistic, on the contrary, it was meaning affirming, uh, it was uh, unsubstantiated. So that was Freud's motivation. Jung's motivation was the opposite. Uh, he was very meaning oriented, but he realized that uh, early 20th century philosophy was going down a path he couldn't follow, a nihil the nihil nihilistic path of materialism, uh, uh, which he considered outright ridiculous. And he wrote it multiple times in his technical corpus that that was a ridiculous metaphysics, but he felt that was a battle he couldn't fight. He was already fighting the battle of psychology. He couldn't fight at the same time the battle for the heart of philosophy, for recovering the intrinsic meaning of the world. So he, he explicitly divorced himself from that and re-acknowledged it only towards the end of his life in his 70s and, and early 80s. So yeah, that divorce uh, has, has a history already of over 100 years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I got the sense that um, that they were concerned about being accepted by the scientific community, and they had to be really firm or, or stringent about not coming across as woo woo in any kind of way. That that certainly was the case of Jung. In the case of Freud, I think Freud was a sincere physicalist, so that was not an issue for him. And what happened after them uh, towards the mid mid 20th century with the uh, Skinner and his black box of behaviorism and all that stuff. Uh, that was psychology becomes science envious. Psychology wanted to be more materialist than science itself was, as if that somehow would affirm their validity. Uh, so I think things went very downhill to the point that uh, behaviorism, which was mainstream in psychology 60 years ago, 70 maybe, uh, was anything but a psychology. It was a psychology that denied the psyche, denied the mind, denied the soul. Uh, uh, and, and where are, I mean, it was ridiculous. Uh, and today we may think it's ridiculous, but something completely analogous is happening today with religious studies. The chairs of religious studies in most universities are atheists. So look at what we do. <laughs> we sort of uh, invert the whole situation. So uh, that absurdity that happened back in the 20th century, we shouldn't dismiss that, oh, we were naive back then. No, no, we, we are still doing it <laughs> in another fashion, in another way. Uh, we have to guard against, against that part of our psychology, which denies itself. Uh, we have that in us, this self-denial. We deny our own psyche. We deny the meaning intrinsic in our very existence. Uh, we deny our own nature as mental beings. Um, and uh, if we don't be careful with it, uh, this denial can, can translate into a world catastrophe as it has almost done in the 20th century. You're, you're speaking to my heart right now. This is the essence of, of my area of concern and passion which is Carl Gustav Jung's concern about a psychology without a psyche. Um, it's very concerning to me for obvious reasons, but also because as therapists, if that's our view, I think it can easily translate into an overly technical and mechanical way of approaching our patients. And it happens a lot, I think. There are a lot of therapists who work uh, in that way. Yes. Um, which that's is unfortunate, right. yeah. Yeah, that's right. I'm dying to ask you, so because I'm, I've, I've fallen in love with your work, but that there are these things that jump out at me that I go, you know, it doesn't sit so well with me. So I'd love to see if we can find common ground. Um, in some of your writings and in some of your interviews, you, you, you take the position that the personal self is an, an illusion. And I see danger with that in terms of the individuation process 
in terms of a psychology without the psyche. I understand that at some level you're trying, you, you know, you're piecing together, you know, mind at large and this oneness of things. But I've seen it so many times, I mean, in my own life and in the life of my patients, is that when we, when we pit one polarity against the other, like self-concern against selflessness, it, it actually reinforces neuroses. It makes us more neurotic. And being at war with ourselves is you know, not helpful, obviously. So would you be willing to perhaps speak to this concern and maybe help me understand you better? I think it's a completely valid concern. And uh, it's one of the dangers of interpreting what I say in a way that I didn't intend, which may not be the fault of the interpreter. Just, it's just because you know you, people come from different perspectives and when they hear something, they fit what they hear into their own perspective. We cannot do anything better than that. And sometimes this refitting uh, uh, leads to a misunderstanding. Uh, I think you are completely right that um, sometimes our psychological problems um, can originate from a lack of respect for our own individual preferences, our own individual notion of comfort, and we allow ourselves to be abused. We allow ourselves to have our space stolen from us. Uh, we allow ourselves to be impinged on by the values of others, and we don't do justice to our own individual selves and what we stand for uh, in the world. So I think that uh, it's bad when we do that. Uh, uh, respect for an, a certain notion of our individual agency is, is critical for psychological uh, health. So let me, let me go all the way out and sympathize entirely with what I think you mean uh, when you said that. So what did I mean then when I said the personal self doesn't exist? What I mean is it doesn't exist as a independent agency. Uh, I think what we call our individual selves are forms of manifestation of nature. Um, what we call uh, a person uh, is a particular way nature is expressing its potentialities for whatever end. Uh, as such, we just are nature in motion. We are something nature is doing uh, through us. We do not exist as cut off agencies that uh, inhabit uh, an alien world, we are that world in a particular form of manifestation. And understanding that in the way I understand, I think is very, very conducive to psychological health because it allows us to not take ourselves too seriously, which can also be psychologically detrimental. For instance, we take ourselves too seriously when we beat ourselves up in regret of something we've done in the past. And we forget to be kind towards ourselves as fallible expressions of nature that uh, we are not know-it-alls. And uh, we, we, there are many things we don't know. And, and it's okay to be compassionate for our own lack and our own faults and weaknesses and shortcomings. Um, so it is in that sense that I think uh, we should not take ourselves too seriously. Um, and, and the notion of fundamentally individual agency, I think is damaging as well, because it puts such an unnatural and unrealistic demand uh, on ourselves. Uh, um, I, I, I don't think that is justifiable by theory or healthy from a psychological point of view. Now, as expressions of nature, we should be respected because nature is doing something through us. So although we are not individual agents, there is something happening through us that has its natural value. So to completely disregard that is also not fine. And that's what I think people do when they become, quote, selfless and they allow their space to be intruded upon they allow their values to be disrespected wait what is it uh, they that they do? what is it that they do when they when they allow that impingement and abuse they are then not recognizing the value of what nature is doing through them ah 
but that doesn't mean that they are fundamentally individual agents. Uh, that kind of self-respect is not, it, it doesn't rest upon this notion that we are fundamentally individual agents. It only requires respect towards nature and our recognition that we too are part of nature. Okay, so, so you don't think that creates a polarity, a binary? Not in the way I, I myself see it. Now, of course, I'm a fallible human being. And when I communicate it, I don't communicate it with, with all the nuance and subtle, subtlety that I feel myself. Yeah. So I fail. I consistently fail in communicating. And I've come to accept that as part of the game. But the way I experience what I'm trying to say uh, uh, entails no conflict of polarities. No, not, none at all. Um, I will demand a minimum space for myself when it comes to how others treat me. But I do that not because I think I am an individual agent. I do that out of respect for what nature is trying to do through me. I respect the tool, not the individual agent, which I think doesn't exist. I respect myself as a particular form of expression of nature. I take that seriously because I think nature doesn't do anything cavalierly. Um, and, and as that form of expression, I will express it in such a way that there is space for that expression, if you know what I mean. I will not uh, willingly accept others from preventing that expression. But while doing that, there is no idea in my mind that I am an individual agent that takes himself very seriously. No, what I take seriously is nature. Doing what it's doing through me. You see yeah, what I mean? I do, I do. And I think I'm grokking you. It, it, but it so easily lends itself to this interpretation around self-denial and, and being at war with our basic instincts sort of somehow that there is something wrong with having self-concern, as if self-concern needs to be divorced from concern for others, as opposed to a, a dialectic. And I'm glad you brought up this point, because now I see how dangerous it is, uh, a possible misinterpretation of what, I, of what I, I, I'm trying to get across. Um, I, I respect the expression of nature, but that doesn't, in my mind, require that I be an individual agent with a will of its own. In fact, the contrary, because I've come to respect myself a lot more since I've dropped the narrative of a personal agent. And I tell you why. I no longer fight what nature is trying to do through me. Um, in, in, in philosophy, um, some philosophers in, in classic philosophy since the time of Socrates, um, Philosophers would talk about a daimon, and by that they didn't mean a demon, even though the word is derived from daimon. A daimon is not malicious, a daimon is morally neutral, it's just an aspect of yourself that you don't identify yourself with. It's the voice in the back of your mind telling you what to do or what not to do. And sometimes that, sometimes that goes head on against the ego's intent. The executive ego may want one thing, but the diamond, that big voice in the back of your head, in the back of your mind, is saying the opposite. Uh, and, and that leads to conflict because we take the executive ego seriously as an individual agent that is separate from the voice of the diamond. And at least in my own life, that was the conflict. The conflict was precisely my narrative that the executive ego was an agent as opposed to just one voice in a, in, in a chorus. Oh, <laughs> and, but, that's, but that's a different paradigm, what you just said there, isn't it? To, to, have the, to, to say that the ego is one voice of many is one thing, which I can really get behind. But to say that it needs to be seen through as an illusion in favor of the diamond, it seems really like you're creating conflict. Uh, no, but, but uh, that's not what I meant. Uh, I don't mean that it's an illusion in favor of the diamond. I think the diamond, too, is an illusion. Yeah. I think all the characters uh, are illusions in the sense that they are not individual agents in and of themselves. They are forms of expression of only one subjectivity, only one 
field of phenomenal subjectivity that underlies all nature and it expresses itself through many voices. So I take all voices equally seriously in the sense that I take them all to be illusions in the specific sense that uh, they are just expressions of one transpersonal field of subjectivity. Uh, but by taking, as I did before, the executive ego as an individual agent and the diamond as another, I would pitch one against the other in an inner war. And I have done that for years, for many years, for many years, I struggled against the diamond trying to assert the will of the executive ego. And if my experience is representative, then I can tell you with very high confidence, it's a struggle that cannot be won. Um, you cannot win from nature. If you, if you perceive yourself as an agent separate from nature and you go to war against nature, not the outside nature, but the nature in you, you will lose that because the executive ego is like a rower in a little boat in the middle of the Atlantic uh, while the greatest storm of the century is happening. Now, you may row in a certain direction, but if you think the boat should go in the direction you're rowing, you are delusional because there are much greater transpersonal forces uh, at will within you. And the diamond is just a nickname we give to those transpersonal forces. So for me, I, 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 enormous step in my own psychological piece was to uh, give up on that war. So now I, I, allow the transpersonal to express itself through me. And the executive ego is now a tool of metacognition. The executive ego observes, sometimes complains, sometimes suffers, well, often enough suffers, but his primary function is to observe and cognize. But it's you though, isn't it? It's not apart from nature. All of it is us, right. the true, right. our true selves. My yeah. true self is the same as my subjectivity when it's devoid of narratives is the same as the subjectivity in you. So that's what I meant by, uh, by understanding that we are not individual agents fundamentally. Uh, but I didn't mean by that, that we should disregard uh, this particular expression of the transpersonal subject, which has the form we call Bernardo or Johannes. Yes. So, Bernardo, how do you square what you just said with uh, Carl Gustav Jung when he talks about that actually central to the process of individuation is, is becoming your own person? I mean, where there's distinctions and boundaries. I mean, that's nothing to scoff at, right? I mean, that was really hard. That was part of, of his, his ontology. Um, so who, who said that? Can you repeat the name? Oh, Carl Gustav Jung. Oh, Jung, Jung, Jung himself. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. About individuation. How he, like, I remember this one interview when he talked about being 11 years old and sort of coming out of a mist and where he recognized himself as not just one of many things, but the sort of I am-ness. And so how do you square that with what you just said? I'm, I'm interested. Um, what? Uh, Jung described when he came out of that mist, if you, if you read it carefully, you realize that what's happening there was the rise of his metacognitive ability, his ability to not only experience, but to know that he was experiencing. And, and he called then the I am. I am, uh, in the history of philosophy and even the history of mysticism, is an expression of self-awareness. Uh, and self-awareness, what is self-awareness? What's the more technical term for, for it? It's metaconsciousness or conscious metacognition. It's the recognition of one's own um, phenomenal states. The, the explicit re-representation of one's inner representations. In other words, you don't only experience, you know that you are the one experiencing. And, and that's critical because without it, you don't have pain, you are the pain. Without it, you don't see a table, you are the table. You are the experience. Metacognition is what is re required for you to separate yourself as subject from the contents of your experiences. So now you aren't the table, now you are the one seeing the table. Now you're not the hunger, you are the one experiencing the hunger. You see, now you're not- Is that real or do you see that as- This is real. Yeah. Metacognition is real. 
No, no, no. I mean the implication of metacognition. Oh, the implication is real. That there's an experiencing subject apart from Yes. The... Oh, yes. Yes, because I think that way too, but it seems to be at odds with the ego is, is uh, not yeah, real. I'll get there. I'll get there. <laughs> so th this recognition is important because it's what allows subjectivity in the universe to recognize its true nature in respect to its own activity. In other words, before metacognition, we are the particular patterns of excitation that we call experiences. And there are many of them. It's like, uh, you know, you have one lake, but that lake can have many forms of ripples of different shapes, sizes, heights, uh, 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 speeds, direction. So a lake can ripple in infinite ways. But the only thing happening is the lake. Because what is, what is a ripple? A ripple is a pattern of excitation of the lake. There is nothing to a ripple but the lake. There is only ever the lake, and the lake is only ever one. So it doesn't matter in how many millions of ways the lake ripples, the only thing going on is the lake. You cannot lift the ripples out of the lake. The ripples are patterns of behavior of the lake, patterns of excitation of the lake. Now, before metacognition, you only see ripples because there is only experience and experience are those patterns of excitation. Metacognition is what allows you to raise your head and realize ah, I am the only thing going on. Everything else that I call experiences and, and their variety are the patterns of excitation of my subjectivity. And this is a crucial step in cognition that is only allowed to happen, can only happen if one develops the ability to re-represent experiences. In other words, to metacognize, to become self-reflective, to become self-aware. And I think we are nature's means for developing this self-awareness. Otherwise, it's a universe of diversity. The only way to go back to, to the lake as opposed to the ripples is through metacognition. And I think we are taking the very, very first steps in that direction. Now, uh, for Jung, individuation, I think, entailed two things. It entails, first, an explicit recognition of our experiences, what he called uh, the contents of the psyche, and he separated between conscious and unconscious, but what he actually meant was phenomenal consciousness and metacognition. Uh, uh, um. So that's one step, but to say that for Jung, an individuated being is an individual agent, I think is inaccurate because for him, individuation entailed metacognition even of the collective unconscious, which is a transpersonal field of the psyche. So by becoming metacognitive of that and recognizing that as part of yourself, you almost by definition can no longer be an individual agent. The moment you recognize the collective unconscious as being you, or you as being a segment of it, philosophically speaking, the concept of a fundamentally separate individual agent is off the table. And then you might, might ask, well, why, why did he then call it individuation? Because what is individuated is the metacognition. That, that ability to metacognize your true self may exist in you and not in another. The other may remain unconscious of the other's true nature, the extent of one's true identity. So an individuated being is an individual in the sense that it has a field of metacognitive awareness that is particular to him. But what he understands as a consequence thereof, himself to be, is not individual by definition, because it entails an awareness of the self with a capital S, you know, the archetype of the self, not only the image, but the usia, the, the, the substance uh, behind that archetype. And in, it entails integrating it as well as your personal shadow and the collective shadow. Uh, so an individual individuated self is a conjunctu oppositorium, to use uh, uh, Jung's uh, uh, words. He is an individual as far as his ability to metacognize, which Jung called consciousness. Um, but he is a transpersonal being encompassing the whole of nature in so far as that which the individual cognizes as being himself. You see the point? 
Yes. Yes, that, that, that sounds reasonable. I think I could get behind that. I think we have to discuss volition and freedom and autonomy. So, so let me think out loud, just a second. So if we go with your, or actually let, let me set the stage this way. Um, a conglomerate of my patients, let's call her Jane. She's married to Bill and Bill is abusive. He treats her poorly. Um, and he puts her down, he's unfaithful, and she just feels bad about herself. And maybe let's say for sake of discussion, she listens to one of your interviews and you talk about the freedom of the slave and she's going, well, that's me, I'm the freedom, I'm doing freedom of the slave, obviously misinterpreting you, obviously. Um, and, but what happens in therapy, right, is that if we're successful, which is not always the case, but if we are and I do my job well and she does her job well, then when she comes out the other side, having worked through a lot of emotions that were repressed, um, that she actually has a sense of being in charge of her life. She, life. she stands up to Bill. She has a sense of a solid sense of self where she sets boundaries. She's not gonna take crap from anybody, no one. And she ends up leaving Bill and has a pretty good life. Um, feeling in charge of her life, no longer organizing her life around giving people what they want, people pleasing, or reactively denying people what they want through defiance. Her life is no longer organized by, by this reactive paradigm. She's actually organizing her life around what's best for her. And so what I'm trying to wrap my head around as I'm listening to you is how do I square that experience, which I've had with hundreds and hundreds of patients, and myself for that matter, um, with what you're saying. And so if we go with the metaphor of the ship on the stormy ocean, right? I can grant you, undoubtedly I can grant you that there are these major impersonal forces that bear on us, right? That, that influence us, of course, no one in their right mind would deny that. But my concern is that that narrative or that view denies the fact that we can actually, if we put our minds to it, we can at least keep the boat dry. We can take buckets of water and get it out of the boat. We have some agency, we have some control over, we can make the journey more enjoyable by, by, the, by the dimension of blood, sweat, and tears, meaning effort. And I'm concerned, my concern is that the way you frame it it, it sort of minimizes the importance of that dimension. I'm sure I misunderstood you, but that's how it receives in me. I'm very grateful to you are doing this because you're making me suddenly aware of how my words can be legitimately interpreted in, in, in a way that I never intended them to be. So this is an opportunity to, to make a clarification I didn't even know was badly needed. So I mean, that sense, I'm very happy we are doing this today. Thank God we are doing this. Um, look, I, I, the freedom of the slave, what I meant by it, if I frame it in the metaphor of Jane's case, uh, with Bill being her former husband, an abusive former husband, this is how I think the metaphor would be correctly interpreted. Jane is a slave, but Bill is not the master. The master is within Jane. The storm in the ocean is within Jane. And so there is a sense in which the recognition of the slave within, but also the master within and the ocean within is, a, is an expression of self-respect. If you say, if you consider the self to be everything that's happening within, which goes far beyond the executive ego, but includes all kinds of transpersonal forces that are expressing themselves through what you call you, uh, respecting those transpersonal forces as they express themselves through you is critical and it's precisely what the metaphor is trying to do so yes you're a slave but the master is within the master is not bill yes you're a boat adrift in the ocean but the ocean is within it's not the market pressures of the economy outside you know what i mean so to self-respect in the way you 
portrayed to your patient is precisely to recognize the master within, to recognize the ocean within. It's precisely to, to acknowledge their validity in face of the world outside or Bill is to say, no, Bill, you, you're not going to do this because what nature is trying to do through me is going in a different direction. And nature will express itself in that way. You are not going to stop it. But that thing that is expressing itself is not your executive ego. It's not your personal preferences. I mean, we, we, we don't choose our professions to a large extent. And if we do choose them, we probably chose wrong and we end up changing at some point in life. Uh, uh, we are moved by transpersonal natural forces. And by saying in, in the context of my metaphor that we are slaves to that, what I'm trying to do is precisely to grant validity to those transpersonal forces expressing themselves through us as opposed to bills, to the bills of the world. Mm -hmm. So the question of personal preferences aside, and then just to the gist of what you said, besides that, we can get to that, but let's see here. So are you when you talk about the master within, are you referring to what you, in your book on why materialism, why materialism is baloney, when you speak to the amorphous I, the witness, the eternal witness, the eternal self, are you, is that the master from your point of view? I think the master exists in that witness but it's not only that witness because um, uh, the slave also exists in that witness. So it's not only the master that is in there, the slave is also there and Bill is also there. <laughs> Everything is in that witness awareness, uh, uh, a subject without narratives. Everything is playing in there. Uh, and, and, and that there is transpersonal that witness is transpersonal. It's identical in me, in you, in the fish, in the paramecium. It's the same everywhere. And it expresses itself through a multitude of different ways, just like the, the lake ripples in a multitude of different ways. Um, so you could see the slave and the master as different, as different ripples. And Bill is on yet another ripple. These are all ripples in that transpersonal field of pure uh, subjectivity. Um, yeah, that, that's what I meant by that. And, and, and by, by, look, what, I, what I'm always trying to emphasize with this notion that uh, there is no true personal self, we are slaves to nature, what I'm trying to, to do is to give validity to, this, to all these other things that are trying to express ourselves, uh, express themselves through us, and which we may have a very egocentric uh, preference for not allowing to manifest. Why? Because we may be living according, for instance, to a moral code that does not grant validity to some of those things that are trying to express themselves. Or we may be driven by the executive ego's need for safety, uh, uh, which then would close the door on th those other things that are trying to manifest themselves through us because they would expose us through risk. To make it concrete, the baby boomer who thinks that once he gets a job, a house with a white picked fence and a dog and a wife and three kids that, uh, that he arrived and now he has to do everything in his power to protect that particular set of circumstances that uh, have a reason, that may lead to a denial of all the rest that nature might be still trying to do through you. And then you generate an, an inner conflict your heart may be screaming, I want to do something else in my life. I want another job. I want to be an artist. I want to live in another place and get to know new people. Uh, or I need a different partner because my relationship has now gone cold and it's no longer self uh, mutually nurturing. So all those things, the executive ego would say, no, 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 I have arrived in a safe place. I have arrived. I am at a destination and I want safety. I want belonging. I cannot risk all this. So I'm speaking to that. I'm speaking to yeah. that artificial notion of an individual self who has arrived and wants safety. Uh, uh, and, and to say that nature doesn't limit itself to that. It's you who created a narrative saying, this, this is what I am. No, 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 nature might be saying, no, I'm not done with you. <laughs> There's a whole lot of other things that need to be expressed 
through this entity you call you. And by the way, this entity that you call you is not separate. It's me, nature. Who the hell are you to stop me? <laughs> Who the hell are you rowing a little boat in the Atlantic to stop the storm or to dictate in which direction you're going? Let and me, if you try to stop it, that's when you get hurt, I think. Okay, let me see if I can metabolize this. Um, so you're, from my point of view, you're talking about conflicting motivations, that there's our beings are multi-layered. There's a side of us that wants safety. And what you're referring to, what nature wants through us, I would call what we want in our hearts of hearts. That's and, exactly it. Right. Okay. So that, that's the difference between what uh, Jim Hollis calls the adaptive self and the natural self. self. Yeah. Yes. I, I see. I'm totally with you with that. I'm totally with you. And yet the, I think it can be probably, I mean, I, I'm probably repeating myself, but I think it can be problematic to, to devalue the, the desire for safety. I think, I think it deserves a certain amount of respect. Oh, that's sure. I, I certainly respect mine. I have lots of insurances. <laughs> I have an alarm system in my house, <laughs> a very high tech one. So okay. that, the cameras, you know, I, I have, but I'm, and I choose to live in a safe place in the world. So I, I, I don't mean to devalue that. I think these are all parts of the spectrum. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that for the same reason that I don't want to devalue our need for safety, I also don't want our need for safety to devalue the rest of the natural self that wants to express itself through us. Totally fair, totally fair. But I'm not, I'm not convinced that the side, the side of um, this individual that wants to hang on to the safety of the home, that that is necessarily attached to narratives. That seems like an instinctive need for safety. You're, you're, you're marrying that with, with sort of being lost or being subscribing to certain narratives. That's not obvious to me. Am I missing something? No, no. It's a matter of balance. Um, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to convey is the need for a form of balance, not, not to delegitimize anything. Again, I, I treasure my safety and I, and I do lots of things for my safety. Um, but my sense of safety, let's make it concrete and let me use my own life as an example, because I can speak freely of that without infringing on anybody else's freedom or privacy. Um, I have a very strong sense or a very strong need for personal safety. Uh, may have to do with the fact that I have led an, an uprooted life. I have lived in four countries, two different continents. Uh, um, the family I have spread around the world. So I, I have had an uprooted life. I cannot, I mean, I'm a Dutch citizen. It's the only citizenship I had, but I didn't watch Sesame Street in Dutch when I was a kid. You <laughs> know what I mean? So I don't really have, I could, I'm not Danish either, although ethnically I'm half Danish because I never lived in, in Denmark and I don't speak really Danish. I can understand some words, but I don't speak it. Neither am I Portuguese. You know, so I have had an uprooted life, which may have been handy for the kind of work I'm doing today, but it has as a consequence this, this need for safety. Now, it's useful. I still grant validity to it. I still sort of nod to it a lot, but it, there was a point in my life in which it has not served me. Uh, it was a point in my life in which uh, I was working for a top 50 uh, uh, Europe, uh, uh, European company, a company that, uh, you know, if that company ceased to exist today, it would take five to 10 years for you to get more modern electronics than you get today. Uh, and if you think Apple is great, Intel is great, Samsung is great, and they all depend on that company I uh, was working for, um, uh, ASML. If, if the techies I need to hear, uh, ASML was the company I was working for. And um, everybody knew me at ASML. Uh, at some point, I think I was the youngest director of the company when I was 33. Um, uh, it, it was my family. A large part of my social life was related to my colleagues, the people I knew in that company, I traveled the world for that company, went around the world multiple times, literally. Uh, I was established, I didn't need to keep on proving myself anymore, I got to a point where, okay, 
we, we know who Bernardo is, we know what he's capable of doing, you know, we respect him for that. It was a very, very safe, comfortable position. Uh, uh, I was part of something much bigger than me, an extremely powerful company, certainly in the region where I live. Um, but then nature wanted to do something else through me. Uh, my natural self wanted to do something else. Um, it wanted to dedicate this expression of life that I call Bernardo entirely to philosophy. A point had arrived for philosophy to not only be uh, my evening and weekend activity, but to be my full-time activity. And I resisted it for five years because I, 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 I thought it's like giving up my family, giving up my house, giving up my safety, giving up the entire social and, and economical network in which I'm established and respected and valued. Uh, know what I mean? Yeah. So I struggled with it for five years. It was only thanks to Fred Matter, who is probably my best friend, uh, thanks to his uh, relentless, ceaseless uh, uh, encouragement for me to do this. He never stopped. Never stopped. Year in, year out, he never stopped. Wait, what do you mean? What, what did he do? Fred, Fred would say, Bernardo, this is where your life is meant to go. Oh. If you don't he, see that, you're blind. Can you not yeah. see this? He mentored yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. For, for five years. Mm. Uh, relentlessly. Uh, not overwhelmingly, not taking my space away, but he wouldn't miss a chance to confront me with this because he knew I knew. I just didn't want to know, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. He knew that I knew. So he was always putting the mirror in front of me. And, and then it took more than that. It took a personal tragedy. It took, well, personal tragedy. If I tell what it is, most people would think, well, what do you mean by tragedy? I had an accident with my alarm system. Um, and I already had uh, uh, tinnitus, um, which was very high, but then it exploded. It's like I, I today I have two dentist drills, like I have one on the right, one on the left. It's like a dentist drill three meters away from each ear. And, uh, and that happened. And uh, twice I thought of killing myself because, you know, doctors just say, well, there is absolutely nothing we can do about this. And that thing is with you day and night. And if you uh, close, shut your ears, you only hear it better because the sound is inside. Um, and it just brought me to the edge of total despair. Um, and it was in that period of weakness, after I sort of recovered my footing a little bit, I began to learn how to live with it, but I was still very fragilized, very, very fragilized. Um, then Fred again uh, came to me, his timing was perfect. He just came to me in the exact day in which I was, you know, well enough to entertain a conversation and think about the future as opposed to pulling the plug on myself, but uh, not well enough that all my defenses would be back in place. Um, so he went in through the crack on the wall right there. Window of opportunity. Yeah. And then he said, it is now or never. Mm. This is your cue. Mm. This is the time. Mm. And, and then I did it. Mm. So, and, and now that I've done it, it happened last year, uh, over a year ago, it is so obvious to me, I feel it in every cell of my body, that that's what had to happen. The storm and the winds and the currents were flowing in that direction. But I was a very, very strong rower. And I kept on rowing, exhausting myself, but I kept on rowing against the current and I managed to keep the boat in place. <laughs> but it was draining my energy. It was draining the life out of me. And I was doing that because my executive ego was attached to that sense of safety I had in, in the environment where I was. And I thought, this is the destination. What am I doing living after I have worked for 40 odd years to arrive? No, so all of those narratives of safety and security and success and money um, and status, uh, because when you are in a company, you have reports and you feel powerful because you tell people what to do. And all of those narratives were precisely what was, what was preventing me 
from just allowing nature to express itself through me the way it wanted to do. Wow, wow, wow. I, mean? I do, I do. And I have a number of reactions. The first one being that I feel closer to you. I'm very honored to, to be that you give me a window into this. It's very honoring. Uh, but wow, so wow, let me gather my thoughts here. So I think I'm seeing something important and you please weigh in. It seems to be a question of vantage point, where you're looking from. Yeah. So from the vantage point of what you're calling the executive ego or the, the, the disciplined rower, from that vantage point, I can grant you that it's about surrender. But from the vantage point of your heart of hearts, it appears to be more about, well, let me, let me put it this way there appears to be at least a component of willpower or autonomy or taking charge of your life. And so it, it, I think it depends on where we localize the vantage point for, the, for how we are talking about this. Absolutely. And look, I'm, I'm far from a perfect uh, communicator, uh, Johannes. I, I am like everybody else, a product of my life, of my history. I happen to be uh, an individual that has always had an extremely strong adaptive self, a very strong ego. I lost my father at 12 and, uh, and my mother tells me today, I was amazed how easily you got over that. And she doesn't know how much I suffered, I suffered uh, how devastating, absolutely devastating the loss of my father was to me because he was the only member of my family I identified with. Everybody else was alien, including my mother. My mother is still an alien to me. I do not understand her at all, at all. And she, she, and she acknowledged that. She says, you know, from the outside, you may look Portuguese, but from the inside, you are your father all the way through. So, which is her way to, to sort of offend me. Um, but uh, from her point of view, what she saw was my adaptive self asserting himself. And, uh, and I, ha I have always had a very strong will, uh, um, what you would call willpower. You know, I've never, backed off from an opportunity because of fear because i figured you know i already faced the worst what else can happen <laughs> that will beat that you know what i mean so i went out to the world you know i i, I left home at basically 17 um and i was like a leaf in the wind i was always in a different country not only to live but to travel through um so i had a very very hard-headed very strong executive ego, very well adapted, very, very powerful. Um, so for me, from my perspective, I have to speak of surrender because that's the point of view that I have had. Yes, I have had the point of view of a very strong individual who was suffering because he was very strong in his adaptive schema, schemes. And I had to surrender to my natural self. So that, that's, from the, that's the point of view I speak to, but yeah. I acknowledge Yes. Immediately to you, and of course, as a therapist, you see all kinds of people. I don't. Um, yes. So I fail in, in yes. emphasize what you are trying to, to emphasize today, which is there are a lot of people who are coming from the opposite yes. extreme. Yes. See, what you're calling um, this executive ego and the, the rower, uh, see, in my ontology, I would call that our, the defensive structure, their defense mechanisms. I'm totally comfortable with that. Okay, okay. And do you grant me that the natural self or what I've referred to as what's in our heart of hearts, that that part of who we are is not impotent? It's the most powerful thing that you can conceive of. It's, it's sheer power. It's like the lava erupting from a volcano. Try to plug the volcano and see what happens. Uh, it's pure power. It's, it's, it's the diamond. It's not for nothing that the Greeks gave it its, uh, its name. It is the diamond. It is irresistible. Uh, fight it, resist it, and all you will succeed in is suffering and getting hurt. Yes. It's the, it's the amorphous eye, the witness that you refer to in the book, Why Materialism. It, it's an expression of it. So, okay, so you would also grant that that 
witness or that I is also not impotent. It's the only thing that is potent. Yeah. yeah. There is nothing else that has any agency. Yeah. See, this including is including the executive ego. It may seem to have agency, but it doesn't. It, uh, you know, another, another metaphor uh, the executive ego is a person with a, a cork trying to plug an erupting volcano. You know, if you try it, you get burned. And we all get burned all the time precisely because we try to plug it. Yeah, this seems to go to, I think we're at the feet of Ian McGilchrist when he talks about the master and the emissary, uh, that the, uh, what you call the adaptive self is the uh, emissary. The left. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, this is so helpful because it's helping me make sense of what you're saying, but through my framework, in the sense that what you're referring to <clears throat> Are, is what I think of as, as defense mechanisms, which when that rules the, our lives, when that's in charge, we're miserable, we're, we're psychically crippled. When the adaptive self rules over the natural self, we are miserable. So when I, when I say that um, there is no personal or individual agency from the perspective I'm speaking of, which is given by the life I've led, and of course I project that life uh, unconsciously onto everybody else, although I know rationally that that's not the case, the message I'm trying to convey is the following. Don't try to go to war against the volcano. You will just get burned. Yes. Accept that uh, that little thing you think can fight a war against the volcano isn't even there. It's just a tool. It's not an agent. And as a tool, it is very important. Look, you, you need to know in which mouth to bring the fork to. So you, you need some kind of individual self-awareness uh, in order to be able to live. That's a tool of nature. Nature is using your self-awareness to go somewhere that is completely transcendent as far as we are concerned. We, who, are, who are we to cognize where nature is going? We have no idea, but we are tools of it. So it, it's a very important, in my, at least for people that come from where I came psychologically, I think it's crucial for them to make this distinction between a true agent and a true tool. Mm -hmm. Because seeing the executive ego as a tool is critical um, because it allows nature to unfold and it also keeps nature in check in the following sense. Um, we all have shadow sides, sides uh, personal and collective, and we are very fond of projecting it uh, elsewhere because we don't recognize that in ourselves. I think the ego, for instance, the conscious metacognitive ego is important for upon recognizing our shadow in the process of individuation and acknowledging the shadow as something that exists within us. The ego is an important tool to say, I recognize you, but I shall not give you free reign. No, your freedom will control. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But these are the activities of a tool, not the activities of a fundamentally separate agent. Because the moment you see yourself as a fundamentally separate agent, now the rest is the opposition. But the opposition is huge, it's all encompassing and overwhelming. And we go to war against it, thinking that somehow we can win that we can achieve control of life. We, we can't, we are not in control. We have never been. Yeah, but Bernardo, that, that which utilizes the tool, I think it really deserves to be acknowledged as something real uh, and not, there's just not simply an impersonal process, uh, a, a result of biochemical processes. They're, oh. they're, you know what I mean? Yeah, but that's, that's the whole theme of every book I have ever written, that uh, I mean, yeah. subjectivity is the only thing that really exists in and of itself. It's not a derivative phenomenon. It's not the product of, of uh, 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 biochemistry. Um, and, and I even go as far as to say that the tool is self-aware. But the tool tells itself a narrative of being that is incompatible with the reality of the situation. Okay, that that I can get behind. That's that kind of that makes good sense. 
Yeah, and, and to me, Johannes, it has been such a, a relief to understand that what I have the knee-jerk reaction to consider to be what I am, in other words, my ego, to understand that it is but a tool, a self-aware tool, but, but a tool, it's here to serve. It's not here to dictate. And it, and it tries to be king, but that only hurts it because it's setting itself in opposition against unsurmountably powerful forces of a transpersonal nature from its perspective, transpersonal from its perspective. Yeah, that's it. And, right. So that's the freedom of the slave I, I talk about, a self-aware slave, um, but a slave who plays a monitoring role. It doesn't give free reign to the shadow side. It doesn't let things run amok, but it doesn't try to bottle up the volcano either. It doesn't try to cork the champagne after it's open um, because that's like swimming against the storm, swimming against the currents. You will eventually lose and you just get hurt in the process. So, I mean, insofar as language goes, this, this, this adds up for me, but, but I think it's also important to underscore that at some level, this tool, the executive functions and so forth, they're, they're not actually apart from the experiencing subject. It's not, you know what I mean? Nothing is apart from the experiencing subject. Uh, I think what we really are is what we know we are, but uh, just our conceptual narratives contradict that. We are pure subjectivity. If we tomorrow went completely amnesic and we would no longer have a personal history, mm -hmm. we would still be what we are, even though nothing uh, in our narratives of self would be applicable anymore because you no longer know your name, you no longer know when you were born, where, where you live, what you do. All those things that we consider to be what we are would be off the table if you went completely amnesic tomorrow, but we would still be that subject we are. And my contention is it's the same subject in you. You I and I, without the narratives, are exactly the same thing, the same pr primordial formless sense of self. And I think everything else happens within that sense of self. So there is a sense, a very real and the only real sense in which we are the whole thing. Yeah. But yes. that we, that, that is the whole thing is not an individual agent. That's what I'm trying to get across. Yeah, it's, it's so fascinating. So Bernardo, if we go with this premise of amnesia and you, there is no narrative because you forgot everything. Would it be fair to say that you would still put the food in your mouth and not my mouth? At an instinctive level, well, it depends on what you consider amnesia. Um, most people with amnesia can still speak their language. So it's not complete amnesia. It's amnesia of episodic memory, but you still have skill memory. Um, then you still have instinct, like you still run away from fire if it's coming towards you. Right. Um, no narrative, no narratives, no narratives. So no episodic memory, you would still have skill memory and you still have instinct memory. So you would still put the fork in their correct mouth. Yeah. But if you would take the, am the amnesia to be absolutely complete, in other words, not only episodic memory, but skill memory and, and instinct would also be off the table. You wouldn't even know what a mouth is, let alone in which mouth to put the fork. Sure, sure. And I think the latter is does more justice to the real subject at play. You mean? What do you mean? The complete lack of differentiation? Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, and and that's why we had to evolve in order to know in which mouth to put the fork. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe this is a hang up on my part, but in my mind, somehow the the differentiated self, natural, not narrative, but still differentiated, and the um, the oneness you're describing, um, they are they're equally real. They're equally real. I think it's real in the sense that it's clearly something that's happening in nature. So it's it's not. It's not an illusion in the sense that it is what it is. I think the illusion comes when we place a particular narrative around it and we say it is a irreducibly individual subject. 
that I think is incorrect. I think it is individual because of the way it has been configured in that transpersonal field of subjectivity, but it's not irreducibly individual. Yeah. I think it can be reduced to the transpersonal. But the fact that something is reducible doesn't mean that it has no form of existence. It has a form of existence in the same way that water has a form of existence, even though it's reducible to hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah. Water is not nothing. It's yeah. reducible. It can be explained in terms of two other things that are not water. But that combination produces a reducible reality that exists in that it, it is experienced. So I think the individual self exists because we experience it, but it only exists in so far as it is experienced. It, it's not irreducible. It's not fundamentally individual. It is just a particular configuration, topological configuration of an underlying transpersonal field of subjectivity. That's, it's so fascinating and I'll keep thinking about it. And, and maybe, you know, somehow in my mind, I see this dialectic that, that, that interweave the pulse of existence and one isn't more real than the other, uh, but... But, but look, for, for, from a psychological perspective, I think what I just said is irrelevant because it's only applicable when we are no longer human, when we die, because I, I think life is the image of that particular configuration that gives rise to the illusion of an individual self. So that's the bottom level as far as psychology is concerned. To go beyond that, you get into philosophy or spirituality uh, or foundations of physics, you, you get to some other level. From, from the perspective of our humanity, I think it's fair to call our natural selves, which are individual, to call that the base level of the hierarchy of mind. I, I don't think you need to dig any deeper to deal with patients because your patients are alive and yeah. you don't deal with dead patients. So no. there is no need to dig deeper than that, if you know. So the, the natural self can be the true bottom level reality uh, as far as psychology is concerned. If, if I were a psychologist, I would consider that the bottom level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you even seem to, in your book again, that I like so much, you even seem to acknowledge that there is something egoic that probably survives death. There She's might be. I, I think memories survive death. Mm -hmm. So even if you're no longer, even if you don't recognize yourself anymore as an individual agent, in the same sense that you don't recognize yourself anymore as a, a, an avatar in your dream, the moment you wake up, you no longer think, oh, I am that avatar in the dream. No, you know, I am the dreamer. I am the guy who was you know, conjuring up the whole dream, not only the avatar. Uh, so you, you have this change in, in the immediate recognition of what you are, but you don't lose the memories of that individual self you thought you were in the same way that you don't lose the memories of the avatar in your dream. You may still remember the dream. You may still remember who you were in the dream, what you were doing in the dream. The memories persist but you would no longer say, I am the avatar in the dream. So I think that when, it's, when the process is complete, we know now it's a, it's a process full of shades of gray. It's a long drawn out process. We know that now, um, but when it's complete, when you pass the last gate of that process and now you're completely and fully and truly dead, um, I think it will be impossible to you to say, oh, I am uh, Johannes uh, 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 kidding. Mm. You would say to yourself, oh, and I thought I was Johannes Kidding. Mm. And you still remember who Johannes Kidding thought he was and the memories and all that. So in that sense, everything that was ever truly real about you persists. Um, but what you thought you were, that thought, although it persists as a memory, it no longer persists as a mode of self-identification. It becomes unsustainable, immediately uh, self-defeating in the same way that it's immediately self-defeating for you to tell yourself, I am the character in my dream after yeah. you wake up. Yeah, see, that does make sense to me. But you can see how at least how what some of you say can be interpreted as actually taking the psyche out of psychology. Taking the, the, the individual psyche out of psychology. That has absolutely never ever being my intent yeah no and I, that, yeah i appreciate how you clarify all of this you seem i think to the individual psyche for as long as we are alive it's the only avenue we have to what is the only true thing that field of subjectivity we are it 
yeah. it expresses itself through what we call the individual psyche. It's really real. But the narrative we tell ourselves about what the individual psyche is as an irreducibly individual piece of mind, I think that narrative is mistaken. Well, any narrative, any narrative that says, here is what I am, uh, it seems to me would miss the mark. Yeah. E even, even the narrative, this is not what I am. I'm not this, e even, yeah. that, even that narrative seems to miss the mark. Yeah, because it would immediately entail that you, what you think yourself to be is limited in some sense. Yeah, exactly. So if, so if, the, if the position is that any narrative, any box, any definition of who we are misses the mark, including uh, positions about what we're not, I'm totally behind it, 100%. I think I understand you, in, and in the sense I understand you, I think you are correct. I would just guard against taking this too far, for instance. Um, if we try to get rid of a patently false narrative we might have about what we are, we can use what you just said as an argument against that, because I cannot even tell what I'm not. Because you see, uh, in, in the important sense, all ripples are the lake. So the lake cannot look at any ripple and say, I am not that ripple. Of course, you are that ripple too. You are not only that ripple, but you are all ripples because there is nothing to the ripples but the lake and you are the lake. So there is nothing you can say is not you in a true level. But if a little ripple has this individual thought, I am separate from the lake then I think it is valid for the ripple to tell itself, I'm full of shit. That narrative I'm telling about myself is wrong. I am not just the ripple. That's you see what I mean? I do. So from the point of the ripple, it's fair for the ripple to have an insight and say, I was wrong about what I thought I was. I was never a fundamentally independent ripple. I have always been the lake. So this negation is valid, but from the point of view of the lake, the lake cannot say, I am not that ripple. No, yeah, sorry, you are that ripple too, because you are the only thing that exists. Right, back to the vantage point question. Yeah, uh, yeah and I, I really like that you brought this up, that you said what you just said, because it goes to a question of methodology. I'm, I'm behind everything you said. And yet when you say, um, you know, the effort to get rid of a false narrative, people can get really entangled and neurotic about that. You know, oh, this is a false thought, or this isn't in line with ultimate truth, and they're just, yeah. You know? So in terms yeah, of me methodology, I, personally, I've actually found it more helpful to just forget about it all and just live in, fully in, in the present, directly experiencing things. That's the best way to get rid of the false narratives. Right. Because if you get rid of the narratives, you're guaranteed to get rid of the false ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's so true. Bernardo, you, you grew up in Brazil, and in a recent interview, you, you said that there's a rare kind of wisdom that was embodied by a man. I think he was a village man, and you didn't elaborate on it, and um, I would love to know more about why he made such an impression on you. Having said that, I need to use the washroom. Can I just... Me too. Okay, great. <laughs> Me too. Okay. I'll be right back. Be right back. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. Okay. Yeah, so we, we left off with my question around um, that you had, you had mentioned this man in the village that he embodied a rare kind of wisdom. You didn't say much more. What, what about him made an impression on you? He, it was not in a village. Uh, my family, by mother's side, they, uh, when I was born, that was no longer the case, but they had a history of um, being Portuguese uh, aristocrats that had come to Brazil you know, over a century ago uh, to manage lands, to landowners. Um, and I don't know whether it's because of a, a product of that past that um, my grandfather, by mother's side, he had, I don't know how you say this in English, uh, he had a lot of land, but it was not farmland. He had the, the, the entire side of a, of, of a hill plus a uh, big, big area at the bottom of the hill. And it was his private land, but most of it was forest, uh, virgin Atlantic uh, forest, just outside Rio, uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. 
And um, I, I grew up as a kid uh, with, having a lot of freedom to sort of explore that land because my family had this, this completely irrational idea that because it was land that belonged to the family, it was safe. But <laughs> there was nothing safe about it. It was virgin forest. Um, but I, I had a lot of freedom to just go explore. And uh, my family paid uh, a, a man and his whole family. So there were two or three uh, smaller houses uh, within that complex. Uh, there was the main house, uh, which was sort of the weekend place uh, for my family. And, and this man and his family lived in, I don't know, 500 meters away, there was this, this other complex of two or three smaller houses where this guy lived with his family and he was paid to take care of the entire land. Uh, and he was allowed to grow vegetables for himself if he wanted uh, to raise uh, chickens and pigs. So he had, an animal. he had a mini farm, but it was his own thing because um, the area was not uh, explored as farmland. So he had his own little farm operation. Oh. And every, every time I was there in the weekend, I used, because I was free, <laughs> I used to go to his house because the way they lived fascinated me. It was so different from, you know, from, you know, an urbanite kid uh, in the weekend being able to see a man, you know, growing vegetables and throwing corn to the chickens. And, you know, it, it, for me, it was like, wow, it is a totally different way of relating to, to life and the world. So I loved to go there and I was completely allowed to go there. So I interacted with this man a lot. Now, this man was literally illiterate. He couldn't read and write. Uh, and even as a kid, you know, eight, nine-year-old kid, I already knew in a very spontaneous way, not in a critical, you know, judgment-based way, but I knew very spontaneously, spontaneously that uh, he was, quote, stupid in the way we define intelligence. Uh, he was a man with very low IQ. I mean, even to an eight, nine-year-old kid, uh, that, that I, I, I could see it. It was not judgment being passed. It was just an observation. You know, the way he spoke, the broken language he spoke, yep. uh, very simple sentences. He never articulated a thought. Yep. Everything was very immediate, you know, Trump-like, you know, very <laughs> short <laughs> phrases. Um, you know, sorry about that. I didn't, I didn't mean to pass any political judge. If you think you know my political visions because of what I just said, you don't. Um, Fair enough. And uh, I, I, I was speaking towards your audience, by the way, not only towards you. Um, but he always struck me as a wise man. And now I, I don't know how to put that in words. Um, certainly not as a kid, uh, but there was something that attracted me to that guy. I wanted to see him work the land. I wanted to hear him speak to the chickens. Uh, you know, there was something that attracted me in, in him, in witnessing how he related to the world. And as an adult, I think I can try to word it by saying that he was plugged into a much broader system than I am plugged in. He, he had a spontaneous way of dealing with his environment that I don't. My, my relationship with the world is mediated by thought. His was not. His was encumbered by thought. So he had a sort of kind of immediate wisdom. He just knew certain things. Uh, and if you asked him why, he would draw blank. And he wouldn't even find it strange. Why are you asking me why? It's just like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so, so heavy on the instinctive flow, less heavy on the metacognition. Very heavy on the instinct and right. almost zero metacognition. Right. Uh, Jung would have called him a profoundly unconscious wise man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which, but, but he could speak a language broken as he did. So to me, that was a rare window mm -hmm. into a way of being that I was completely insulated from even as a nine-year-old kid, if you know what I mean. The way the guy talked to the weather, he talked to the birds. It's like, what is happening here? And there was something in me that recognized it as real and not nonsense. And so, yeah, that, that's the first, he, he is already dead. Mm. He, I was told, by, I haven't been in Brazil for decades, um, but I was told by acquaintances that uh, he had died a few years ago. Wow, that's a beautiful picture. That's a beautiful picture. This is probably a professional hazard, but part of where my mind went was 
thinking about the, the fine line between giving a child freedom and neglecting them. Yeah, no, I was never neglected. Uh, oh. No, I certainly was not neglected. But my parents' sense of potential danger uh, was naive compared to the sense we have today about what could be dangerous uh, for a child. Yeah. I climbed rocks that one slip and I would be dead. And my mother uh, to this day has no idea what I did as a kid, lose in the wild around Rio de Janeiro. I mean, I had an idyllic childhood. Uh, I, I, I really miss uh, those times. Yes. You, but you also alluded to the idea of a, a sense of not having deep roots, sort of culturally homeless. Yeah, I mean, when you're a kid, you are much more exposed to your family than to your country. Uh, exposure, exposure to the country begins with school and later on high school, university, then you're really exposed more to the country. Um, but as a kid, you know, I, I was not educated as most Brazilian kids would be educated. I think my father, my, my father loved Brazil, but then there, there wasn't a cell of Brazilian in him. I mean, he loved the heat. He liked the heat. Uh, he, he liked the weather. Uh, but he, my, my notion of what it means to be a male adult uh, was in conflict with what I began to see around in the country once I got older. So um, if you ask me, do I feel Brazilian? Um, and I, I, I'll tell you wonderful things about Brazil because I had a great time there, but I don't feel Brazilian at all. Um, I, I, I went, last time I went to Brazil, it was for one week in 1998, I think, or 1999, it was just one week. Um, and I felt so alien so alien that it, it, it made it difficult because everybody has the expectation that you are one of them because you're born there and Brazilians like Americans, they have the law of the land. You are where you're born. For Europeans, where you're born is irrelevant. Uh, what matters is uh, where your family is and the ethnicity of your family. So you are Dutch if you're born from a Dutch family, even if you're born in Thailand, if you know what I mean. Uh, Brazilians don't have that because like the US, it's a country of immigrants. So you cannot use that to define Brazilianness because Brazilians are Japanese or Africans or Europeans and you know, Brazilians are from everywhere. Um, so there was that cultural expectation when I was there in the late 90s for one week that that was one of them. Uh, and to live up to that expectation was very difficult. Um, but what, what accounted? What accounted for the for the sense of feeling alien there? What what, what accounts for that? Uh, Brazilian society uh, is a. I will use a certain word, but I don't mean it pejoratively at all. Brazilian society is tribalist in the sense that um, it's your tribe that counts, and your tribe is your family and friends. Screw the society at large, mm -hmm. and screw the individualist. Uh, the individualist will suffer because he doesn't have a tribe to protect him and he will be shunned. Yep. Um, and society at large, that's why there is so much corruption. Screw that because those other tribes are not the tribes I care about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dutch society is the uh, mirror image of that. In Dutch society, it's the tribalism that is wrong. Uh, you are respected as an individual and as individuals, we make sure that we contribute to society as a whole. So the whole of society is our tribe. So we make sure that uh, people that we don't know uh, personally have all the support they need, that old people get uh, assistance from nurses, that there are enough clubs for people to socially integrate, even if, the, if, even if they don't have uh, uh, immediate friends. So there is this dichotomy. People say that the Northern Europeans are very individualist. On the contrary, they are the ultimate collectivists. Mm. But it's a collectivism that starts from your individual self. It, it starts from what nature is manifesting is through you, respect to that. And then we go collectivist to make sure that everybody is enabled to have a minimally decent life. Uh, Brazilians, uh, um, in that sense, are not collectivists because they focus on the tribe and the collective of the tribe, which is a small collective. They don't focus on the bigger collective of the country and they shun the individuals. So you have to surrender your own dispositions 
in order to fit into your immediate tribe, your group of friends and family. And um, I could never do that. I could never be a member of a tribe, a member of a gang, a member of a group of friends. And I remember when I was getting a little older that people would uh, show up in my building and they'd say, it's Sunday, sunny, and they'd say, come on, let's go to the beach. We are all going to the beach. And I'd say, no, I don't feel like going to the beach today. And people would go like, what do you mean? But everybody is going to the beach. And I was like, but I am not everybody. Why should I want to go to the beach? Because everybody was going to the beach. But in that psychology, that made total sense. If everybody in the tribe wanted to go to the beach, that meant everybody. So you had to go to the beach too, because it's tribal thinking. It's group mind. And I didn't understand that as a kid. I suffered from that as a kid. Uh, um, I understand it as an adult. So this is only one instance of, of a cultural difference that uh, makes it uh, very hard for me. I have always been, as my mother says, I have always been my father. So the Northern European side of my family, as opposed to the Portuguese and Brazilian side, because I grew up there. So, look, I'm not criticizing anybody. That, that's what's very important. Uh, uh, Brazil, my time there was fantastic. I would never have had the opportunity to have the childhood I had uh, uh, if my family was in Northern Europe from the get-go. Uh, uh, the freedom I had, the contact with nature that I had as a child was uh, priceless. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I began to grow up into my teens, then it, it began to hurt because now you're exposed to society at large and that society contradicts who you are and the way you want to live and, and started becoming painful. So, you know, uh, being the, the second generation that returns home uh, in the sense, because after my father died, you know, Europe became invested with the magic of going back to the roots, uh, sort of um, um, finding my father again. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, yes. So that started playing in my mind when I was 12 and my father died. So Europe became sort of the return of the prodigal son. Mm. You know, that, that was what yeah. had to happen. It happened very quickly. I yeah. uh, finished my wow. education in Switzerland, which is not quite Northern Europe, but close enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and, and now, now I've been for decades uh, and, and where my heart really is. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, here I feel normal. <laughs> if mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. I love that you're you're wading into a little bit of sociology. I think it's just so much fun to hear this. You're also describing some of my conflicts. I mean, I I grew up in Sweden, but at 15 moved to the United States and then back to Sweden for a while. And so I I can share, I can identify with what you're describing, the sense of being culturally homeless. So it's very meaningful to me to hear you describe this. And uh, and my fiance, she's uh, she's Latina. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite familiar with, uh, with the Latin culture and some of the things you're describing. So you recognize what I said? I do, although it blew my mind the way you, there was a nuance there that blew my mind, which was um, when you said that they're actually, actually not collectivist in the true sense. That's yeah. wild, whoever, I mean, wild. The Dutch are much more collective collectivists than yeah. the Brazilians is Swedes. I mean, I'm assuming there's a and Swedes, of course. Oh, yeah. certainly the whole of Scandinavian is highly yeah. collectivist. That's right. That's right. But but hang on here. Hang on. There's so much to look at. I mean, because the other thing you're saying is that you're not a conformist. You're not going to go to the beach if you don't feel like it. I couldn't. Yeah, which I which I respect a great deal, by the way, as I'm sure you can imagine uh, to this thing about autonomy and staying true to yourself and all of that. Um, and I paid the price for it, Johannes. I mean, as, at, at the same time, not. At the same time, I, a lot of uh, certain aspects of my personality that are very handy formed precisely because of that. But uh, as, a, as a young teenager, uh, teenagers had groups of friends for protection against other groups. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, physically, even if you get into a fight. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I wouldn't be a member of any gang, I mean, I would, I would uh, traffic through all the gangs, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I was friends with all of them, friends. I was acquainted with all of them. I would speak yep. to all of them. Yep. But there was none that I was a member of. So I, mm -hmm. I was on my own. Mm -hmm. So very early on, you know, I had to go to karate and jiu-jitsu school and, you know, had that tough mentality uh, to wow. prevent bullying from even beginning because that's one of the things my father taught me very early on 
was um, uh, the only way to stop bullying is to cut it from the root. You don't let it even begin. And, and this was the 80s. So I got advice that I would never give a kid today. And my father would say, um, uh, get into a fight. The worst that will happen is that you have a broken arm and I will go pick you up at the hospital. Uh -huh. It doesn't get any worse than that. And then I thought, this, is, this isn't that bad at all. So it's okay. If it's, so the, his point was, if you start being bullied, immediately get into the fight. And it doesn't matter if you win or lose because they will leave you alone. Well, the bully always wants a free pass. He doesn't want to get into conflict. So like, did you get it shaped so my, yeah, so my, my, my natural way of being, which made me sort of alien based on the expectations and values of the society around me, it toughened me up uh, and it allowed me to, to feel relatively comfortable uh, uh, playing my adaptive self out through life. Mm -hmm. uh, without being overwhelmed by anxiety, uh, which I think uh, is the problem you see uh, in one of the problems you see in the therapy room is people who couldn't just form a strong enough adaptive self. Yes. Um, yes. So I didn't have that problem because it was forced on me very, very, very early mm. to have to build that because I was statistically different. And I say statistically, it's important. Brazilian society is a very, very heterogeneous society. There is everything there. There are towns where you speak German, towns where you speak Dutch, towns where you speak Japanese. So there is everything. But there is a statistical average that is very present. present. And it's the true Brazilian as is that mix, that statistical average. And I was, you know, I don't know, six sigma deviated from that, from that mean value. So I was very off the average. And uh, it was very confrontational, but it helped me build an adaptive self very, very early on. So even mm. after my father died, I mm. still had that boom mentality, like not even this is going to stop me. Wow. Wow. Did, did you end up scrapping and having some fights? When I was a kid? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure thing. I was uh, from the karate kid generation, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I was never bullied. My father was spot on. Nice. It doesn't, yeah, I, matter. I it doesn't matter if you win or lose. You yeah. are not bullied anymore. Yes. Yeah, I, I totally appreciate that. Um, but you're, you know, you're underscoring the pain as well of the alienation. Does that mean, Bernardo, that when you said, I don't want to go to the beach today, I don't feel like it, it, it really did um, diminish or weaken some of those friendships with those people that went to the beach? Totally. Wow. Totally. Because Bernardo was not prepared to sacrifice himself in the name of the group. Yeah. So I was not reliable. Wow. See, I, I, I differentiated myself. But see, that to me makes you so reliable. I can, I can count on you to be honest about your feelings. In the Netherlands too. In the Netherlands, that's what you're expected to do. Yeah. So people are at ease with you. For instance, uh, people are at ease to invite you for things. Because they know that if you're not comfortable, you just say no, and it will be okay. Uh, but in other places, people may be uneasy to invite you at things because they might think he will accept because he will feel forced yes. for social reasons. Yes. And, uh, we don't have this here. So Americans, when they come to the Netherlands, uh, although they are closer to the Netherlands than Brazilian are, Brazilians are, but uh, even Americans, they think we are rude because uh, we say things straight on. We don't dance around mm -hmm. to, to say something. Mm -hmm. now, if you don't like something or if you don't want something, you just say it head on. N no polishing whatsoever. And for some Americans, that's very confrontational. And for the British, it's extremely confrontational. <laughs> they, it makes they you think we are a bunch of bastards. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes you so ultimately reliable and trustworthy. Me personally. Yes, you, you and I, the people in, in the Netherlands, I suppose, if, if you're... Oh, we speak our minds. Yes, that's, that's so what that, I find. That's what we associated with trust. Yes. But uh, uh, Brazilians wouldn't associate this with trust. Trust for them is conformance to the group. Yeah. You can be counted on to conform with the group. Yeah. That's reliability. You see, there is a sense in which this is a proper application of the word. There is a sense in which this is actually reliable. You can be relied to conform to the values and dispositions of the group. You can be relied on as a member of the group. Uh, in the Netherlands, you can be relied on as somebody who gives expression to your personal dispositions, once and, and, and non-ones. Uh, 
Um, so the word is properly applicable in both cases, but uh, the meaning is completely different in either yes. case. Yes. Again, it goes back to the vantage point. Are we looking at this from, um, can I get Bernardo to do what I want him to do? Or can I count on him to be true to himself? And we can connect through that authenticity. Yeah, because we value this individuality of expression. So uh, it, what, you, what you say is important as far as the individual self. I agree with you in the sense that, that you mean it. Uh, uh, we have to honor this particular expression of nature that we are. We are a certain kind of flower and not another. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but, uh, and, and, but this doesn't contradict the statement I made that uh, the individual self, ontologically speaking, is reducible and therefore an illusion. Uh, so in that sense, it's an illusion. But I think as an expression of nature, we need to be respected. And in, in countries that have this innate respect for the particular ma manifestation of nature that each one of us are, uh, they project that need for respect onto others, and therefore they rely on others insofar as the other also respects his individuality. Because I respect my own, I rely on others respecting their own. So we can have social commerce in a clear way that doesn't lead to discomfort. Uh, but the expectations are different in other places. And for me, that was very clear because of my childhood. I know from very early on that expectations can be different from my natural expectations because yeah. I was confronted with that very early on. Yeah. And, 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 and I even started as an adult thinking about how my father lived. How was he happy there? And, um, and, and my, my mother helped me put it all together. My father was a loner mm. uh, in Brazilian society. He mm. didn't have close friends that came to visit. I hardly remember mm -hmm. anyone coming to visit from, mm -hmm. from his side. Mm -hmm. We would visit his family uh, you know, the Danes, we would visit them I, weekends, but he, there was never a friend of his coming by. So uh, he was happy because he liked the weather. He liked the heat, which I hate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Bernardo, no, you finish it, finish. Yeah, so, so he found, he, he carved his own space for himself. He had a whole, whole lot of hobbies. Mm -hmm. Electronics was a hobby of his, became my profession. Mm -hmm. uh, flying model airplanes became a hobby of his. Mm. So he, his social engagements were through hobbies, through clubs, exactly like we do in Northern Europe. Mm. So my intuition as a kid was right. He was never a Brazilian. Yeah. And his love for Brazil was something else. It was a different type of love, if you know what I mean. Yes. Well, well, well. So, Bernardo, that which is seen through your eyes right now, that which is detecting what I'm saying and comprehending it and deliberating it, responding... From your point of view, it's mind at large. It's this cosmic consciousness. One field of subjectivity, taking a point of view in you, another point of view in me, but ultimately one field of subjectivity expressing itself through a variety of ways, like the variety of ripples that you can have on a lake. Mm. And you can point at each ripple and say, that's the ripple. You can locate its spatial boundaries. You can give it physical characteristics. This ripple is this high, this, it has this breadth. It moves in that direction with that speed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but that doesn't mean that there is anything to the ripple other than the lake in which it ripples. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can locate each other in space. We can attribute physical and psychological character characteristics to each of us. Mm -hmm. We can say, you know, you are there and I am here. You are this old, I am this old. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that there is anything else going on in us other than that underlying field of subjectivity, uh, mm -hmm. the lake in which we ripple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. You said something once that, that jumped out at me, which was, I can't remember word for word, but it was something like, life is, is bizarre. If you think about it, it's strange. It's just bizarre thing. And, and, and I agree with that. But what jumps out at me, Bernardo, is that the very statement, the very opinion uh, seems to include some reference point in order to determine that it is bizarre. And, and what is that? What is that reference? <laughs> I was always afraid I would get this question one day. <laughs> <laughs> now it has happened. <laughs> what happened? Oh, gosh. And despite years of trying to prepare for this question um, and not 
to sound like a nut <laughs> in answering it honestly. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I am prepared uh, to answer it in an honest way that safeguards my image. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it may Although, be unbelievable what I'm about to say. Yeah. Okay. No, just, but I know you do shadow work where you challenge yourself to go against your image when you wrote about cosmic consciousness as a way of challenging your image. So I know this is in line with your priorities. So that's why I'm going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> because to hell with my image. Um, I'm an already confessed to so many things online in different interviews. I mean, there is nothing to safeguard anymore. Um, but it, despite all that, it will still sound strange. Um, I, I know that uh, it's a current view that what the memories I'm about to relate are impossible. Um, and, and maybe I am not, maybe I have confabulated these memories. I don't know, maybe that's the case. But whatever the case, it, it's the most honest answer I can give. Um, I remember being a baby. I remember looking around my room at things, looking at toys. And I remember thinking as a baby, this is so bizarre. <laughs> This is so weird. Mm -hmm. What the hell is this? Mm -hmm. Now, it may be unbelievable to most psychologists, especially developmental psychologists, um, maybe not clinical psychologists because they are used to weirdness every day. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, research psychologists may consider this uh, nearly impossible. Like he can't possibly even have had the thought as a baby, let alone remember it and articulate it in words. Of course, back then I didn't articulate the thought in words. I only remember the smell of it, the smell of weirdness. Mm -hmm. I, I remember sitting on a, on a living room rug, a thick living room rug with a TV much taller than me in front of me and tall sofas further away and I remember this, this feeling. This is so weird. Mm, mm. This, this whole thing, what is this? This is mm. weird. And um, I think on the outside, people looking at me, what they would have seen would be a baby, a kid who couldn't even walk yet, like this. <laughs> and there are photos of me like this. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it comes from that time yeah. this yeah. memory of that sheer sense of weirdness and now if you ask me but you didn't answer my question because i asked for the reference i don't know the reference i presumably, don't presumably where you came from prior whatever that was yeah <laughs> but i remember this very present all encompassing feeling of uncanniness and weirdness not yeah. not of threats it wasn't threatening i didn't feel threatened at all yeah. I just remember the weirdness. Yeah. And, and today, if I have two days of quietness in which I'm not giving any interview, I'm not working, I'm just quiet, going for a walk in the forest, and then I meditate after those two days, I can still put myself back in that place. I can still go in that place and looking around and think, ah, this is mighty weird. I, it's I very pleasant. That... Yeah, and I think it's precious. I think it's precious. My my version of that, I was I think I was seven years old. I remember a period where I was seven years old and I would go into the bathroom and lock the door and just just stand and look out the window. And I was just filled with this like awe or puzzlement, like wonder, like I'm alive. Like it was just the strangest thing to me. Like I'm alive. I, I just I had one say, oh, pardon me. I had a similar one, but it was later than you. You were precocious. <laughs> I think I had one, well, maybe not that older, maybe 10 years older, 10 years old or 11 at most, uh, having the feeling for six months, I had this thought. Um, usually in the morning after waking up, I would have the thought, I am not the world. Huh. I have never been the world. I'm just a person within the world. And I would feel a cold shiver go down my spine, literally the cold, cold shiver, like running slowly down my spine, all the way to the bottom of my spine. And I remember the uncanniness of that thought, of that realization. It happened for six months. And then, then it was normal. Yeah, of course, I am me. I'm not the world. But at that point, this, 
that difference was also very weird. And one, one more thing I just thought of, uh, Johannes, uh, uh, when I was this baby finding the wor world weird, I remember the most weird thing about it. I remember the feeling, and I can put words to it only now, not, not then, but uh, depth, spatial depth was very weird. That <laughs> I could see something that I couldn't reach. Yeah. That, uh, that, that, that there was this depth, that, that, that there was space, that there was dimensionality. It was very weird that not everything was here that things were there yeah that was very uncanny yeah very very yeah i think it's completely plausible i mean i have no qualms about that at all um i mean and there's ont ontological implications here which are fascinating um but in terms of what you just shared right which uh which is the um is that, that was sort of your fall from grace huh the the being separate yeah from yeah yeah, no you know, I know it to have been that. Back then, I thought I'm just becoming an adult and I'm realizing what is real. Yeah, yeah. Now I know that reality was before. Mm, mm. But Bernard, you know what strikes me as as you as you mentioned the being a, a baby and having these experiences, it strikes me that one of the ontological implications is that conceptual structure knowing certain concepts is actually not a prerequisite for perceiving the world. You know, some people take that position that you can't recognize a chair without the con knowing the concept of a chair, for example. I, to some extent, am sympathetic to that position, but uh, not, in, not in a way that contradicts where you're coming from, I think. Um, we certainly perceive what we now call a chair before we have the concepts for it. Yeah. But what we call a chair is concept laden. Sure. If today I look at a chair, what I see is not really what is there. Yeah. What I see is a tiling of what's there with a conceptual cobwork, uh, a cobweb of, of, of concepts. So I, I think today, in most adults, we lose contact with reality as it is before we tile it up with a web of concepts. Yeah. Uh, but there is something perceived before there is this web of concept. It just becomes invisible to us now because we have the web of concepts in between. Uh, but there is this something there that uh, the name chair doesn't, does, doesn't do justice uh, yeah. to. Yes. I mean, the and, and that was the unca unca uncanny thing aspect of the world when I was a baby mm -hmm. because I, I didn't have this conceptual tiling mm -hmm. to render it familiar through yeah. narratives because giving a name makes everything familiar. It creates an illusion of understanding and familiarity. For instance, we have no idea where the, the effect of um, the acceleration of the universe's expansion, we have no idea where that comes from, but we give it a name, we call it dark energy. And suddenly we feel all warm and fuzzy inside that we have some grip because we gave it a name. So giving names and applying concepts to things, uh, I think that's my personal intuition, I'm not a psychologist, it contributes to our feeling safe and secure and uh, contributes to building the, the familiarity of the world. And when I was a baby, I didn't have that. So the world was uncanny. I, I don't know, I'm trying to explain something that I can't, so. Oh, I love it, we're thinking out loud. I mean, the concept helps me know how to relate to that thing. And it, and it gives me a sense of the function of that thing. Aha, uh -huh, this is associated with sitting. Um, yeah. But prior to that, um, there's an experience. And yeah. there, I believe there's also discernment, not necessarily around what the function is of that chair, um, but the, I think we're not, we're not, um, differences are not necessarily lost to us. I suppose you could argue that, man, well, that just means you have the concept of this versus that difference. Maybe that's a core concept and that's why you can differentiate things. I don't know, what do you think? I think there is a way to differentiate things without a conceptual armor. Um, although the differentiations probably would go along different boundaries and different lines than the lines imposed by our conceptual dictionary, but I, I, I'm remembering I'm remembering myself as a baby, and I certainly differentiated things. I, I could differentiate uh, how do you call it when 
you hang something on top mm -hmm. of a, a, mm -hmm. a baby's uh, um, crib. Like a dream catcher? Uh, it rotates, it has oh, things okay. hanging from it. Uh, dream catcher, huh? Dream catcher? Yeah, yeah. It's like this native thing that's supposed no, to... No, no, no. That's not that. It's, uh, oh. it, 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 it has figures hanging from it, like oh, clowns yeah. or horses. Yeah. And, yes. And it has mirrors and it, the lights flash and it rotates a little bit. Oh, okay, okay. And it's to, to keep the baby entertained when the baby is looking up. Yeah. I remember seeing that. Yeah. And I didn't have a concept for that, but it was clearly differentiated in my perceptual awareness. Yes. I saw that. That thing had an existence. Yes. Fascinating. You know, and some would argue that, well, you, you probably had a concept of thing, object, and that's why you could differentiate it. So it was pre language. So whatever concepts I had were not language oriented. Yeah, that's, I agree. I, I think. Agree. I agree with you. I agree with you. But the, uh, yeah, the, the most uncanny thing for me was spatiality, hmm. was the idea that things are there and not here. That hmm. was just mind blowing for my baby self. It, uh, anyway, I imagine. I'm sure developmental psychology can explain that in some way. But uh, yeah, well, I imagine that this this had a role in how you gravitated towards idealism. Not an ex explicit role that I would be able to report on, but probably in the underlying streams of my yeah. uh, 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 psychic development, probably this had a, this played a role. Yes. Uh, but I, uh, today I tend to see some reality in, in, in those early days. Uh, I think the tendency in our society is to see life as a constant evolution forward in cognition and knowledge. So whatever you thought or felt before, uh, if it's different from what you think and feel today, then the past is wrong and today is right because we are always going forward. It's a monotonic progression towards truer cognition from our baby time until our adult time. I don't think things are that simple. Today, I look back to my way of relating to the world when I was much younger, which are all associated with Brazil. That's why I have these wonderful memories. Um, and I think, I have duped myself in the meantime about a number of my ordinary intuitions today that uh, I my the glasses through which I contemplated the world back then in some respects they were cleaner more transparent less distorting mm -hmm. and the conceptual glasses are, are, I wear today mm -hmm. they are more distorting in some senses they, they are more clarifying in some senses but more distorting in others they they hide certain aspects of reality that, that were directly accessible to me then. And now I lost access to that. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, wow. Here's, here's something that's coming to my mind. The, uh, the view of idealism, this, this one mind at large. Um, if I have understood things properly, it's not, combat it's not compatible with a Buddhist view, which I actually think is a good thing. I'm not a fan of Buddhism. Um, my understanding of Buddhism is that the, it's, it's akin to annihilism, and they're going to say I've misunderstood it and so on, but I don't think so. If you pull back the curtains and actually look at it, th their view is that there really is only these impersonal processes, and whatever we think of as an observer or witness or experiencer, it's simply a function, just the way a chair has a function of sitting. Um, but if I've, I, I could be wrong, but is it fair to say that you don't square with that Buddhist notion? The way you put it, I don't square with that. That is okay. correct. Okay. Um, of course, no, Buddhist literature is ginormous. Um, it, it's not a restricted canon like in Christianity, where there has been a selection already made. We group all of those scriptures in one book called the Bible, and that's it. That's the canon. In Buddhism, the canon is ginormous. There is no single human being can read the entire Buddhist canon. And it was written by an enormous variety of people over 25 centuries. Mm -hmm. So when we say Buddhism, you know, what do we mean? And whose version of Buddhism is that? Is that Nagarjuna's? Is that uh, uh, um, a more modern sage uh, like um, uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj? Well, that, that was Hinduism, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, take another... Uh, 
anyway, uh, is it the Zen view of Buddhism? Is it the Mahayana school? Uh, you know, is it the, the Sun? I forgot. There is another school in Japan that's completely different from, from Zen, but it's also Buddhism. So my own prejudiced, biased, personal interpretation of what Buddhism means when they talk about the void, when they talk about there being no self, my own interpretation of that, which is then, of course, compatible with my own narrative. <laughs> I'm trying to fit it to my own narrative to some extent. So I'm, I'm perfectly happy to acknowledge my bias here. But my own interpretation is what they mean by no self is no individual self, no differentiated self. Differentiated selves are epiphenomenal. They exist as epiphenomenal, but they are reducible. And what they mean by the void is a transpersonal mind at rest. Uh, a non-excited field of mentation. And then it's a void because there are no objects, because objects are experiences and experiences are excitations of the field. If the field is at rest, or if the field has only one carrier wave, which Hinduists and Buddhists call the drone, the, like the, the base frequency of vibration, which is always there and everything is modulated on top of it. So if it's, if it's mind at rest or, or only the drone as a pattern of excitation, then they call it the void because there are no objects. There are no explicit experiences. There is only the potential for experiencing. But of course, that void is a no thing, but not a nothing. Potentials are not nothing. But potentials, there's a sense in which the potentials are everything. The potential for something to happen is not nothing. It is just a no thing. It's not a thing, but it's not nothing. So the void is not a nothing. The void is mind, transpersonal mind at rest, no personal self, uh, uh, exhibiting only the potential for everything, but no expression of the potential. So that's my interpretation of the no self, no personal self, and the void, which is mind at rest. Well, I can hear my Buddhist friends in my mind going, yeah, he, that's it, he got it, you know, that's, that's accurate, you know. Um, but they would also say that this transpersonal mind is not to be reified. It's actually empty. Even that is empty. There is nothing you can point to and say that's, that's what it is. It doesn't exist, which translates to a psychology without a psyche. In other words, there's no one really home. Like you once said in one of your interviews, there's no, there's no castro, there's just castro being, which is at, it's at odds with the witness, the, the changeless witness. Okay, so now I will go beyond my own philosophy. There is only one place where I touched upon this, and that was a book called More Than Allegory, uh, a book that goes beyond the official story I am prepared to defend on rational and empirical grounds. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go in a direction now that I do not know how to defend on rational and empirical grounds. It's an extension of my normal shtick, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, so please, audience, don't hold me to that, <laughs> because... Uh, it's, it's quicksand territory now. There is a sense, I uh, to. there are things that are ineffable, that cannot be put in words, that cannot be put in rational spatial temporal terms. And yet they are so present, present and so self-evident in certain states of mind that it is impossible to dismiss them as non-real. Uh, there is a part of your mind that actually cognizes it, but in a non-verbal way, in a non-explicit way, uh, and you cannot make an argument for it. And that's why many schools, including of Buddhism, have completely given up on describing reality. All they do is point to it in the hope that you will look in the right direction and you see it for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the description then ceases being a description and it becomes uh, a sort of enchantment, uh, which is what um, Peter Kingsley called it. He called it a form of uh, metis, a form of, in a good sense, a form of trickery. And uh, you think you are reading a description, but it's actually meant to trick you into seeing the thing that you, that you think is being described. Um, so it becomes a form of incantation. And, um, and they will use lies, deception, contradiction. They will use whatever they can, whatever tools they can to sort of trick yourself into seeing what's actually going on. 
and sort of seen through your logical narratives, because the ground level of reality does not comply to Aristotelian logic. We are just monkeys on planet Earth. What makes us think that our axiomatic thinking uh, uh, reflects and captures all the salient aspects of nature. I mean, they do capture physics until now. Physics is now going in the direction where not even Aristotelian logic can follow. There was a big discussion about this in the 1970s in philosophy. You know, uh, to what extent does quantum physics completely break Aristotelian logic and we have to come up with a different logic. But uh, I think the bottom, the true bottom level of reality, the actual pristine truth, not our approximation of it, because the battle I fight is for a better approximation, and I'm very cognizant of it. We talked about it in the beginning. There is, we cannot articulate the absolute truth with the human intellect. Our only game is to be honest about what we already have reasons to discard and adopting a better hypothesis that is closer to truth. That's the game I fight. But I think it is possible under certain states of mind to have a quick glimpse into the pristine bottom level of reality. And I think that's possible because we are real beings. I mean, we, we are part of nature. We are rooted in it. Whatever reality is, we are immersed in it. So it's possible to sort of see through our narratives, trick our own logic, and suddenly have an ineffable, unwordable glimpse into the sheer naked bottom level of what's going on. And that cannot be articulated in logic and in language. So people will use forms of trickery to try to see that, including saying, you know what, there is actually really nothing going on. And this particular statement is one I happen to understand. And I, uh, let me try to do what I didn't, I tried to do in the book in more than allegory. Let me try to do it verbally. It's the best way I know to try to even remotely hint at why there is actually nothing going on and why nothing ever has actually gone on. <laughs> Not, it's, not that, it's not that nothing doesn't exist. Uh, sorry. I'm not saying that existence is nothing. I'm saying that nothing is going on, not even as a verb. Um, the way to approximate it in rational terms, you can follow your rationality until a point where it breaks. And then hopefully at the edge of that precipice, before your vertigo pulls you back into rationality and you say, this is nonsense, there is a fraction of a second in which you will actually see what's down there before your vertigo makes you pull back. So I'll try to use that, you get one shot at this. Huh? <laughs> Let's look at time. We think time is, is extended from the past to the future. And the past is an ever growing monster that eats into the future. And the present is a thin boundary between the two that moves along as the past grows and the future shortens. But we, do you ever experience the past? And you may say, oh, of course, Bernardo, you just told me about your experiences when you were a baby. Of course you experienced the past. Is that really true? Because what I'm experiencing is a memory of the past. And that memory experience is an experience now. Mm -hmm. I only experience my memories now. The past no longer exists. I cannot point at it and say, there it is. It doesn't exist. My memories are experienced now. And even if I remember remembering, that experience happens now. And the future is an expectation. It's not there. You cannot point at it and say, there it is. The future is an expectation. I mean, since, since Aquinas, I think we can, was it Aquinas? I don't remember who, who said that first. Maybe it was John Scotus again. I don't remember my history of philosophy anymore. But uh, it's true now as it was true then, if then never existed. The future is just an expectation. If you experience it, it's present already. It's no longer the future. But, but this, this is not really controversial, is it? It's not. That's why I'm still in rational territory. Right. Okay. But now let's explore the implications of this. How long is the present? I mean, if I say present, the moment my mouth began to move to say present, that was already past. Present is now. No, no, that's past. Present is now. Okay. Know what I mean? Tracking you. How, how long is this? In any period of time, you can always cut it up in three pieces and say past, present, and future. Yep. And you can keep doing that infinitesimally to, to an infinitesimally small present. In other words, the present has no dimension. Uh, it's the only thing that exists, but it, it is nothing. 
everything that happens happens in that infinitesimally small slit in between memory and expectation. All of existence is in that slit, but doesn't matter how small you make that slit, it's smaller. In other words, nothing ever happens. It's, yes, I mean, it's, it's nothing that can be pinpointed. As soon as you think you can pinpoint it, it's already gone. I'm totally with you there, right? But, but I would caution against jumping to the conclusion that because of that, it's nothing. We have to be very careful about translating an ineffable but true insight into a narrative because that translation distorts the true insight and we begin living something that is actually false. Um, this, ha this happens a lot with religion. People who have a true insight that if they translate, they cannot translate in any other way by saying, I am God. But then the moment they say that, it's no longer true. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm trying to hint at? So, I think so yeah. When, when the Buddhists say nothing is going on, there is nothing. I know why they are saying that, but the moment it's said, mm -hmm. it's wrong. Mm -hmm. The moment it's worded, mm -hmm. it's false. Mm -hmm. But I, I think to know where that is coming from, and I would even say there is no other way to word it. There's no other way to word it. It's the best you can do in words is to, is to say nothing is going on. Existence comes out of nothing at every moment. And it's made of nothing. But the moment I say it, it's wrong. Yeah. I mean, you're using a, you're, you're beginning with a temporal thought structure, right? Past, present, future. And, and it's quite a leap then to go from a temporal conceptualization to talk about everything as in existence itself. You're, you seem to be conflating this uh, view of time with existence itself, like they're one and the same. Is that, am I, is that accurate? And logically, you are accurate. Um, and that's the whole difficulty. You, say, you, you see, you can immediately point out where I'm committing a fallacy. Yes. And you are correct. And that's why I never defend this point of view. Actually, I just went on a rampage against Carlo Rovelli because he said, as a scientist, there is nothing. So I went on, I went, on, I went nuts against him because he was saying this. He was wording it and presenting it as a logical conclusion out of Nagarjuna's uh, uh, logical writings. And, and I thought, no, no, th this is not a valid move in the game. Yeah. You know, this is not a valid move in the game. This is cheating. Yes. And I wrote an enormous essay criticizing him and was having a discussion the other day with him in private until three in the morning via email. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, and this will sound completely contradictory and it will be in the space of logic and, and, and time. At the same time, I know he's right. Mm. The problem is he's not allowed to say it. Mm. Neither, I, neither am I allowed to say it, because the moment we say it, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. We no, are trying to transport something that is outside logic, space, and time. Mm -hmm. We are trying to fish that from out there, move it within logic, space, and time, and pretending that it still works. Mm. It doesn't. You yeah. cannot take that fish out of the lake and serve it for dinner. The <laughs> fish disappears the moment you pull it out of the water. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I appreciate. So I, yeah. I stand by my criticism of Rovelli because I think he made an invalid move in this chess game. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not a valid move. It's cheating. Don't mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. But reality is not the chess game. Mm -hmm. What we think is real, according to our logical axioms and our ideas of space and time, is an intellectual game. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to play it because I think we can play it better than we have been playing so far. Yeah. So if I grant the rules of the game as valid, mm -hmm. I think we are not playing the best way we can. That's why materialism is false. According to the rules of the game, you don't That's need false. to transcend the game into mystical territory to prove that materialism, whatever the truth is, materialism is not it. That's that done deal. It's the worst move on the table. It's it, 
it's a valid move, but it's it loses the game immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And we can already see checkmate five moves. Actually, checkmate is already on the board. <laughs> so, so everything, almost everything you hear from me, except parts of my book, More Than Allegory, everything else you hear from me is a concession to the rules of the game. And my point is we can play it better. But in my heart of hearts, I do know that there is more to reality than the game. Mm. And it operates according to other rules. The rules of the game are a convention of human cognition. You can glimpse at what's happening behind the game. What goes wrong is when you try to pull that into the board of the game, because then it's an invalid move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I will forever criticize invalid moves, even though I know where they're coming from. Even if I know where that intuition that Ravel is appealing to, I know where that's coming from. Yes. I, I, I've seen what he's seeing. But yeah. you cannot play that move on the board. Yeah, yeah. And if you well, play, I would jump and say, invalid move, you are cheating, take it back, <laughs> which is exactly what I did. So you, you see, more dangerous than a bad move is an invalid move that gets invested with the belief of people because of the authority of the player. Yeah. And yeah. that's why I came out against Ravelli so strongly. People trust that he is a level headed, objective person. Mm -hmm. When he makes an invalid move, he can destroy the game because people will think, oh, it's a valid move. And mm -hmm. now the whole game will change and it will be chaos mm -hmm. because we are infringing the rules and we don't even know that we are doing that. Yeah, yeah. So I would jump on his throat and say, don't play this move because it will be wrongly misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. People will make of it something it's not mm -hmm. because you cannot pull this fish out of the water and expect it to still exist. It doesn't when you, it only exists in the water. Mm -hmm. So you play the wrong move and it's a dangerous move because people expect that you play world level chess. Mm. People expect you, you know, there is no Italian, uh, um, there is an Italian, mm. very good player now, um, forgot his name, Eduardo, no, Caruana, Eduardo Caruana. Anyway, people will think that Ravelli is Caruana playing chess and they will, they, they will never even question that he played an illegal move. Of course he played a legal move. Mm -hmm. And that would destroy the game. It would destroy everything we've built since the Enlightenment. Um, but again, and I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. It's so difficult to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. I have seen the fish he saw. Mm -hmm. I just am against pulling that fish out of the water and expecting it to exist after you do it. It doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate your passion and your point of view. And I think you're also acknowledging that you appreciated my rebuttal. You, within the rules of the game, you're completely right. Yeah. There is no defeating what you just said. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's the game that we call life. Yeah. Okay. So unless you see the fish for yourself, saying what I said is wrong. Yeah. Why okay. did I say that? In order to illustrate the difficulty of the problem. Yeah, so fair. nobody should take what I said to be the truth. It's not. Yeah. Because I took a fish out of the water and I'm presenting it to you as if it were still the same fish. It's not. It has undergone magical chemical transformation. And now it's false. The moment I say it, it's false. Totally fair. Totally fair. Totally fair. So, Bernardo, the reason that, that, that we cannot say that you're flirting with, a nihil, with um, a nihilism, nihilism, the reason we say that you're not flirting with nihilism right now is that the, the field of potentiality is real. Absolutely. That right. nothingness I'm talking about is pregnant with everything. It's not a nothing, really. <laughs> but it but there isn't a word that makes a difference between these two types of nothing. Yeah. And we can't even invent because to invent a word, we are appealing to a common intuition that we label with a certain sound. Mm -hmm. In other words, a word. Mm -hmm. But that common intuition is not part of culture. Mm -hmm. So it is impossible to even create a word for that pregnant nothing I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. but the moment I say it's really nothing, it's wrong. Yet it's the closest word yes. that can but be used. Yes, but, but the caveat of calling it a pregnant nothing is helpful. It moves us in the right direction. It's equally valid to call it everything as it is to call it nothing. Right. So that realization comes from a space in which there is no difference between nothing and everything. 
Right. Now, you cannot wrap any logic around it to make it make sense. It just doesn't. Now, you, you can wrap uh, uh, banal logic to make sense of this, uh, uh, but, but that's banal, and that's not what I mean. Like you can say, if this house belongs to everybody, then it belongs to no one. Mm -hmm. Because if you eliminate differentiation, then everything is nothing. Yeah, but that's a banal uh -huh. right insight in philosophy. I mean it in a much deeper, much more ontically rich way than just a game of conceptual definitions. Uh -huh. um, but again, if I word it, I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. And I am deserving of being criticized. Because <laughs> this is very important. People would say, oh, he's saying he's wrong, but he knows he's not actually being wrong. There is some subtle truth in the uh -huh. words he used. No, there isn't. Uh -huh. There isn't. It's just wrong. The moment uh -huh. I say it, it's just wrong. Whatever you try to make of it in thought is wrong. The statement is wrong. It is not true that there is nothing going on. It's uh -huh. not true. So there is no subtle truth behind it. No, the only validity of saying these words in the context I said it is in the context of metis, in the context of trickery, in the context of an enchantation. It's to trick you to see. Back to methodology. Yeah. 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 But, but then it's no longer philosophy mm -hmm. because philosophy is about saying what's true. Yes. Not yeah. tricking you into seeing an uh, ineffable truth. That's yeah. not certainly not the game of analytic 21st century philosophy. So if you hear this from my words and you think about it and you try to figure out in what way it's true, no, you, you're just wrong. You will either be brought to the edge of the precipice and take a glimpse at it before your vertical brings you back to the safe ground of logic and understanding, or you will not see it. If you don't see it, there is no logic and understanding that you can wrestle out of this. It's just plain wrong. It's false. Yeah. Nothing more than that. Its only value is to trick. If it fails to trick, there is no value. See, so I'm I failed to trick you. I could see <laughs> in your eyes that I failed to trick you. You yeah. never left that solid ground of, no, no, wait a moment. Let me understand what he's saying. You never left that. You didn't even get to the vertical. You can see it in people's eyes when they suddenly go like, huh? and then, no, 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 but this cannot be right. Yeah, you're, you're correct. This cannot be right. The question is, have you seen it? Well, here's the, here's the thing. I lived for a couple of years at a Zen Buddhist monastery. I've been very, very deep in the spiritual path. We meditated, you know, week for weeks on, you know, for weeks, you know, 15 hours a day. So I've had very powerful meditative experiences. I've been around the spiritual block, if you will. And, and I'm down with what you're saying, but I would, what I want to underscore is that the way we, and I think you're saying the same thing, the way we conceptualize that glimpse of the fish is not only does it matter a great deal, it poses a lot of risk. Yes. And I think we're if down- If you try to make a narrative out of it and tell people this is what it is, yes. it's not only false and wrong, it's dangerous. Yes. Because it, it makes uh, invalid moves. Yeah. It undermines the very foundation of the game we are playing. Yeah. I, yeah no. The way to undermine the game is to see beyond it, not to play it according to wrong rules. <laughs> you see? Mm. It, 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 you may say, well, that's precisely what we want to do. We want to undermine the game to see the truth. Yeah, but that kind of undermining is not the undermining you get. When mm. you continue to play the game, just cheating. Mm. That's worse than the game. Mm -hmm. Playing the game wrongly and still playing it and pretending that you're playing it mm -hmm. is worse than mm -hmm. to play it right. Mm -hmm. See, and through I, the I, game, that, that's what we all want. Mm -hmm. but, and, and I was not referring to the insights after long meditation. To me personally, uh, uh, Johannes, I, I, I had some deep insights in meditative practice, sometimes uh, aided by, uh, by psychedelics. Mm -hmm. um, but what I was trying to hint at to you mm -hmm. happened suddenly in a restaurant one day in a discussion with two friends while I was drinking wine, one glass of wine. In a crowded place, it, it's the kind of thing that it just happens to you. And it's like a, a moment. It's like a flash. And for a moment, you see it, and, and then it's gone. And you're lucky if you retained a memory of the feeling. Um, and, and so... It's that tiny memory of a feeling that I'm holding on to, to, to say everything I've said in the past 
five or 10 minutes. Um, it was not out of meditative discipline. I want to I want to underscore for the viewer right now what a big deal it is what you're doing what you're saying right now, because what you're doing is you are anchoring all of your thoughts and your abstractions into inductive first person experiences there that deserves tremendous respect. In other words, I want the viewer to see that Bernardo is not just playing around with abstractions. He's anchor, you're anchoring everything you're saying into first person direct experience. That deserves a lot of credit. You're inductive, not deductive. But notice that everything I said in the last 10 minutes or so about you know, the nothingness um, is an aspect of my philosophy that um, is, um, It's not even part of the main storyline of my philosophy. It's, an, uh, it's uh, a sideshow in one book out of mm -hmm. 10 and a whole lot of papers and essays. Um, it's a part of my philosophy that I never tried to, to substantiate with reason and evidence because I know it's impossible. And the mm -hmm. moment you try to do that, you are already wrong. What you will be saying will already be wrong from the get-go. Um, the rest of my philosophy... Um, is largely deductive, but you are correct that it's anchored on personal experience as well, but not the particular personal experience I was talking about in the restaurant. When I, when I understood why some people say nothing is going on, there is nothing, when I understood why they're saying that. I know that saying that is wrong. It's literally wrong to say that there is nothing and nothing is going on, but I understand why these were the words they chose I understand. I you know understand. I mean? so that particular experience in the restaurant does not inform the rest of my philosophy because it is impossible to construct a philosophy around it because that would be trying to serve the fish for dinner, the fish that disappears once you pull it out of the water. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. So my philosophy is partly out of the first person experience, but not that particular one. Uh, it's, it's just an experiential relation with the world as experiential in nature. So I live my philosophy. And in that sense, it's not only conceptual for me. I live, I live in a world that is experiential in nature. That's my life. Yes. Um, yes. But it is still a philosophy play, a, playing accord, according, played according to the rules of the chess game. I just hope to win the chess game, to play better moves, but I'm obeying the rules of the game. And, and the rules of the game are the post-enlightenment rules, internal logical consistency, coherency, empirical adequacy, conceptual parsimony, and explanatory power. So I, 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 just, I choose yeah. to play by those rules, but I don't think those rules are absolute. Yeah, I just love you for your passion. Uh, is it really true? that your philosophy is deductive, it seems to me that it's actually more inferential, that if you really, really get to the core of it, it's based off of first person perspective experience, and you have inferred certain positions based off of that. So it seems more inferential than deductive. Am I wrong? What am I missing? Every theory of nature, every ontology, every metaphysics uh, uh, is inferential unless you're a solipsist. Uh, a solipsist is the one who believes that only his own life exists, that life is his own private dream and nobody else is conscious. The other people exist only as images in his own dream. That's solipsism. Um, so that's the ultimate skeptical philosophy in the sense that you infer nothing but your own experiences, which are not inferential because you have them. Anything that is not solipsism, so materialism, dualism, panpsychism, idealism, and all their myriad variations, they are all per force inferential because we are inferring something that exists beyond our private experiences of the world because we are not solipsists. So in that sense, you're correct. But in the argument for our respective positions, we take deductive steps. For instance, the step of saying, if I can explain everything without postulating the ontological category we call matter, then, based on the principle of parsimony, I should not make 
that postulate because oh. it's conceptually inflationary. Oh. Therefore, are deduced from this that matter does not exist. So the argument is involves deduction, although the theory is eminently inferential. That's so interesting. You're talking about a priori, a priori, um, uh, an, an approach of a priori, right? Is that what it's called? Uh, deduction operates according to a priori rules yeah. that are not themselves uh, provable. They are just taken for granted as being self-evident. For instance, if A is identical to B and B is identical to C, then A, of course, is identical to C. That's the distributive principle, uh, and, and it's considered to be self-evident. Or if A is false, then it cannot be true. And if A is true, then it's not false. Moreover, if I know that A is not false, then it must be true. Or if I know that A is certainly not true, then it has to be false. That's the law of excluded middle in Aristotelian logic, another axiom. None of these axioms can be proven. They, are, they sound self-evident to us. They require no substantiation, no proof, no explanation. We just immediately think this is self-evident. It cannot be any different. So Aristotelian logic is based on like five of these axioms. And we know that if you look deeper, you can undermine each and every one of them because you cannot use logic to prove the validity of logic without begging the question, without arguing in circularity. So for instance, there are alternative logics like intuitionism that reject the law of excluded middle. To prove that something cannot be false does not mean that it's necessarily true under intuitionism. And you I, may think this is- I agree with that. But uh, most people would say this is absurd. If it's not false, then it can only be true. Well, according to intuition, intuitionism, not. So every step of deduction is based on one of a set of ax axiomatic rules of derivation. In other words, it's based on certain things that you take for granted without criticism. Yes. And well, I call them the rules of the game we are playing. Uh, so you see, now, now it, it all comes together. Yep. We are playing a game based on certain rules. Those rules are arbitrary. We just think they are self-evident, but that's what monkeys on planet Earth think. It doesn't mean that it's true. It's what yeah. monkeys think. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know? It's the way monkeys put together their cognition. So I accept those as a given because those are the rules of the post-enlightenment culture in which I live. And my point is, even if I accept those rules, I can play the game better. And if I play the game better, it leads me to better conclusions than materialism far better but i'm still very cognizant that the rules of the game are arbitrary yeah, yeah. there is something that underlies the rules of the game see to me that is that that just seems so obvious that the intellectual way that we approach life is simply one set of spectacles or one or, or one it's a dashboard as, as you like to say it just seems abundantly obvious to me uh if if you oh. have go ahead no, conclude, conclude. Oh, if you have any sense at all of awe and mystery, that there's something mysterious about life and consciousness, it appears natural to conclude that these loss of logic and so on, they're just one dimension. This is what you know because of the life you live. You're a therapist. You're dealing every day with the scary mystery of the human psyche, which is a window into a transpersonal psyche. So you deal with these nuances, subtleties, these mysteries and uncertainties every day, this, this lack of absolute references, this lack of absolute rules. The psyche doesn't really unfold according to absolute rules. It's, it's, always, it's always fluidic. Um, it, it, it is always reconfiguring itself. It's always deceiving itself, uh, even. Uh, and this is your daily experience, and it's the daily experience of a whole lot of other people. But the people who set the tone of the mainstream narrative do not have this life. Yeah. These are people who, who uh, they are lar largely nerds uh, uh, in the sense that uh, they overvalue one psychic function to the expense of all other psychic functions. And they say, oh, only the rational intellect is reliable. Intuition is not, feeling is not, perceptual awareness is not, 
you know, so it's the rules of the game they play because of their particular psychic configuration. The problem is they are dominant. And these are the people we listen to. They are the spokespeople of science. They are even modern analytic philosophers who almost 100% adopt this limited perspective. Um, they have set the rules of the game and the rules of the game are the rules that they are most comfortable with because of their particular psychic dispositions, uh, strengths and weaknesses. They have become influential in the sense that they have, because of the success of technology, the people who produce science, science who are the people who are focused on this particular psychic function, this particular mental function they have, they have been elevated to the people who to tell us what's true and what's not because of the overwhelming success of technology. And by the way, technology is developed by engineers who are a little bit more flexible. Engineers are a kind that uh, doesn't care what's true or what's not. They only care about what, what works and what doesn't work. If it works, the underlying theory about it, whether it's true or not, they don't give a darn. <laughs> no, they don't give a damn about it. Um, but they are still nerdish in the sense that they feel most comfortable, most safe against their own shadow and their own primitive impulses, as Freud put it, mm -hmm. if they uh, frame the whole game according to the rules of logic and the rational intellect. And they have set the tone of the culture. So now, because the game is so biased, uh, because these are the kinds of people who set the narrative and define the rules, it's so biased by them that if you want to change the outcome, if you want to change the conclusion, you have to play by their rules of the game because they have succeeded in delegitimizing everything else. They have succeeded in, in convincing everybody that intuition is totally unreliable. It's flaky. It's hand waving woo woo. It's no, I don't trust your intuition. You know, no, how can you do that? Um, spiritual insight is completely unreliable because if you translate it into logic, it makes no sense. So it's nonsense. Forget about all that. So they call it the romanticism. It's seen as romanticism. romanticism. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So all that nuance, all of those other mental faculties that nature has imbued us with are now neglected because the game is biased. So what I do, um, and I've been very open about it to anyone who cares to ask like you did, I just bite the bullet and I, I realize, okay, that's the rules of the game. Uh, and I, I can either fight the battle according to the rules of the game, or I can try to fight to change the rules of the game. Now, people have been doing the latter, trying to fight to change the rules of the game for a couple of centuries to no avail. The hippies tried it, they failed. The uh, new thought movement tried it, failed. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, new Advaita is trying and is failing. Anybody who has tried in the West to fight the rules of the game as opposed to winning the game has failed. So I figured I'll give it a try to fight in the game according to the rules of the game. And I'll use the weapons of the opposition and let's see who, who plays the game better. That, that's basically what I'm doing. <laughs> I love it. Change the system from within the system. Not because I think it's great, but because I think it's it's the only alternative that hasn't been explored yet. I mean, the whole of Essential Foundation, which I'm leading, the whole game of Essential Foundation is exactly this, is to say, you know what? We are not going to even dispute the rules of the game. We would, we would, we would take it for granted. We are not endorsing it, but we are accepting to play according to it rigor rigorously and strictly yeah. with no concession to anything yeah. beyond the rules. Yeah. And let's see uh, if, if, if we play ourselves according to the rules of the game, let's see who checkmates the other. So that's what, that's what we are trying to do because it, I don't think it has been tried in a consequent way before. People have tried before to use logic, reason and evidence as well, but always mixed in with spiritual insight. So you always get something that's neither rational nor spiritual. Because you know, true spirituality transcends logic so much that it's incompatible with rationality. I and mean, Peter Kingsley has wrote book, has written book after book, making this this case very compellingly that you cannot reconcile spiritual truth with reason, or it's impossible to do that. And the other way around doesn't work either. You cannot hope to 
close a rational argument if in one of the crucial steps you insert spiritual insight. Yeah. It, it, it violates the entire derivation, if you know, the entire argument is broken by doing that because you're mixing the rules of different games. Yep. Uh, so that's yep. what we are doing. But in, in doing this, in accepting the rules, in, in accepting to play according to the rules, it doesn't mean that we are endorsing the rules. Mm -hmm. I don't endorse the rules. I don't. Mm -hmm. I think these are rules that have been invented by nerds who happen to have become successful on the back of technology. That success is based on an illegitimate logical bridge. The idea that what works reveals profound insight about what is. It does no such a thing. What works is totally unrelated to what is. You know, there are many isness that are compatible with how things work. Uh, but because of this fallacious logical bridge, these nerds now set the tone to our culture. And I thought, I'll play like a nerd. Let's see if I can be a better nerd. <laughs> I love it. I, love I don't it. endorse the rules. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I'll, I'll presume some common ground around the idea that it's possible when we philosophize and, and think about all these matters that we can become more and more divorced from our instinctual life, our carnal life, our, our heart of hearts, that that is a risk inherent in the act of philosophizing and thinking about the truth, right? Can, can you say something about your views on how to best mitigate that danger? In other words, how do we engage in philosophy or philosophizing? How do we reflect on the truth and try to get at the truth in a way that doesn't, it isn't harmful to our mental health? Um, the philosophy you are alluding to, which has this risk full on, is what we call analytic philosophy which is a philosophy that has existed for a little, a little over a century. It began with Whitehead, with uh, Bertrand Russell in the early 20th century, arguably with uh, the early Wittgenstein. Um, and what they realized was that philosophy as it had been done up until that moment, which today we call continental philosophy, uh, that philosophy suffered from um, conceptual ambiguity. So when Nietzsche talked about the Ubermensch, there is nowhere in Nietzsche where you can read the precise definition of what he means by that word. He's basically appealing to one's intuition. The problem is that it becomes vague and people can interpret it in a completely different way as it actually happened. Mm -hmm. Nietzsche has been <laughs> interpreted in, in myriad different ways, including by the Nazis uh, in ways that were completely unfair. Mm -hmm. But he left that door open because of his conceptual ambiguity. Yep. Uh, and analytic philosophy was created in the Anglo-Saxon uh, schools, so England, United States, um, in order to combat conceptual ambiguity. So they figured that they would do philosophy in a different way by being very precise about what they meant with each word. The pr so uh, an honorable goal, the problem is that it became very quickly translated into uh, uh, detached conceptual narratives. Philosophy lost its connect connection with our true being, with our heart of hearts, with our felt relationship to ourselves and the world. It became a, a game of, of thoughts, conceptual thoughts in our heads, um, uh, which, which is in, indirect at best. Mm -hmm. It became di disconnected from direct experience. It became purely conceptual. It became spiritual in a psychological sense. Uh, it sublimated our, our being, the, the integrity and, and, and the holistic nature of our being uh, in the name of abstraction. And that happened not only to philosophy, it happened to science. Science today is a game of pure abstraction, foundations of physics. There are a few people combating this. Uh, Sabine Hosenfelder is one that is playing, is fighting and very honorable but probably losing fights, trying to bring Philip's uh, physics back to reality, as opposed to a game of pure abstraction as cosmology and foundations of physics are, are becoming today. So this is an, a, a psychological affliction that humanity is undergoing as a whole um, throughout the 20th and now into the 21st century. It's fairly recent in historical terms, but it affects philosophy and affects science as well. We are losing our connection to the ground of reality and we are going all the way into pure abstraction. So in that sense, philosophy is dangerous. 
science too is dangerous for exactly same exactly the same reason but the philosophy you're talking about here is that analytic philosophy because before that philosophy was a thing of the heart nietzsche wrote he poured his heart out there is a quote from nietzsche in which he says exactly that that philosophizing is is taking everything we have of passion of will of suffering of hope all of that and burning it in the fire of our philosophy so he is linking philosophy directly to to to, to our whole being kierkegaard kierkegaard uh, in um, closer to us right uh, kierkegaard um, or kierkegaard as the english say or the dutch kierkegaard um, <laughs> That guy wrote from his heart, even though he wrote conceptually. I mean, uh, he has a famous paragraph in which he tries to describe what the self is. And he goes for sentence after sentence saying, the self is a relation between the self and itself. But it's not just a relation, it's a relation of the relations of the self. And, and it's ludicrous what he's doing. Um, um, but behind that conceptual ludicrousness, which he did on purpose because of his indirect communication, he was basically criticizing somebody else indirectly by writing that tortuous way. He was probably criticizing Hegel by writing in that way. The, the Kierkegaard, he had multiple layers of meaning. He was a genius in that sense. Uh, he, he always wrote from his heart. He is a guy who did not marry the love of his heart, who wanted to marry him was in love with him and he didn't marry her because he thought it would prevent prevent him from doing true philosophy out of his heart oh my god because he thought it would shut the valve of his heart he oh. thought it would bring contentment to his life oh my god. he thought he would retire and become a priest in some chapel in 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 Jutland uh, uh in Jutland uh, depending on whose pronunciation you get you know from the other side of Denmark Denmark from you guys yeah. um the sandy side where there are only dunes and sheep he thought that's where he would end up with his beloved wife and he would preach the Sunday sermon and live a life of contentment and he thought he wouldn't be able to do philosophy because philosophy poured out from the heart oh. therefore he could not be content Oh my so God. he 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 was crucified by Danish society because he basically forced the girl to accept to break the engagement by acting like an ass. Mm. So he started acting like an ass in order for her to not regret uh, breaking the engagement with him. Oh and we know God. that because in his diaries he sh he, he wrote how much. It, he was suffering from, from, from doing that. He was doing that for her because he thought if he would just break the engagement, it would break her heart. So what he did was he painted himself as a complete ass such that she would want to break the engagement with him. So she wouldn't suffer, but he did. And we know that because of his diaries. He was a prolific writer in his diaries. So that was philosophy. That is anything but conceptual and abstract. <laughs> now go back to Plato. No, no, let's go be beyond Plato. Let's go to Parmenides and Pedocles. That's philosophy pouring out of the heart. That was these guys' way of relating to the world. The legend says that Parmenides jumped inside Mount Etna, the volcano, to prove that he was an eternal being. <laughs> so that was not abstraction. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Where his mouth is, yeah. Yeah, so if you want to know how to do philosophy in such a way that we don't go into spiritual realms of pure abstraction, we just have to do philosophy as it was done originally. Wow. We have and, to go back to true philosophy. And, and the, cre the key criteria, the, the key defining characteristic of that is what again? That it's not an abstract thing. Philosophy uh -huh. is a wording of the way you relate to yourself and the world. Nothing could be more present. Nothing could do more justice to, to our heart of hearts. Nietzsche wrote only from his heart of hearts. Conceptually, he contradicted himself all over the place. Even Schopenhauer, who was a very rational philosopher, he is writing from his heart. That's why he, he, he writes badly against women, because his mother uh, abused him. His mother mistreated him. So he, you know, even when he didn't want to, he was writing from his heart. <laughs> uh, that's how philosophy was always done. The, uh, the most level-headed philosopher of the 
through classical times, I think was Spinoza, mm -hmm. who suffered a whole lot as well, but he managed to, despite all that, remain level-headed and write philosophy like Euclides wrote his book on geometry in terms of theorems and proofs and axioms and all that, uh, and, uh, and cor corollaries. Uh, but even him, even him, despite all that formalism that sounds so, it looks so abstract, if you dig one level deeper, the man is writing from his heart. He's pouring his heart out. He was a lonely man who was excommunicated by his faith, the Jewish faith, and had to live a life of solitude, uh, grinding lenses in the attic of someone else's house where he rented a room. And he died there in his 40s because of inhaling uh, particles of glass that gave him consumption, which was a catch-all term in those times for anything that affects your lungs, in including tuberculosis. So these guys, they lived their philosophy. They embodied their philosophy. Mm -hmm. Philosophy that's not embodied is a 100-year-old abnormality, mm -hmm. uh, 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 an aberration. <laughs> Yeah. in the history of philosophy yeah. it, but it, because we live in this time and our reference are these 100 years we think that that's how philosophy is no it's an analytic philosophy started with very good motivations very good goals but it became an aberration mm. today it's an aberration it's hardly philosophy because mm. it's so completely abstract yeah. i tell you this uh, 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 johannes uh, and, and I will say that to anyone who wants to hear this, in public or otherwise, most analytic philosophers of mind today have not a clue what mind is. Mm. They don't have a clue what it is. They, they have zero introspective power. Well, not all of them, but many of them have hardly any power of introspection to have a clue of the subject of their study, yet they are writing theses and books on mind when they don't have the faintest idea what mind actually is. That's why you have whole schools of analytic philosophy saying today with a straight face that mind doesn't exist, that it's an illusion. An illusion of what? Of mind? Well, then it does exist, right? No, 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 they say it doesn't exist. So people with PhDs, with tenure, in top universities telling the world with a straight face that mind does not exist. This is how distorted, how an aberration philosophy has become because of abstraction. But again, that's not true philosophy. That's not the philosophy of the 2,400 years before the past century. Wow, that is a helpful perspective. And I, I, it drives me bananas too, people denying mind and talking about it, but they're not actually, there's no experiential component. And they're completely dissociated. Uh, it's pathological. They should be talking to you. Uh, <laughs> but because of the nature of their pathology, they will not even recognize that it exists. And therefore, they will not come to you until life hits them in the face with a train. Agreed. And then their defenses will be brought down. Then they will become fragilized. And then they may give you a call. Yeah. And in a certain way, I hope it happens to them mm -hmm. uh, in a way that is not doesn't cause permanent damage. Yeah, yeah. I agree. When you spoke about Kierkegaard, I, I, um, I had the thought that what he did there was either incredibly admirable or, and or some, something also self-punitive, of a self-punitive nature, huh? I was not, uh, it was not my intent to pass judgment on uh, Kierkegaard's philosophy. So I'm, 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 I didn't mean to say that it was good or bad, proper or improper, no, no, right I know. or wrong. Yeah, and my intent was to say it came from it poured out of his heart. Yes, uh, yes, obviously, obviously. But think about I, that. giving up the love of your life. I mean, either that's incredibly admirable, or there's something self-flagellating about it as well, huh? Yeah, he, he's, he's certainly. And it's he's not alone. Nietzsche did the same. Yeah, yeah. And for the same reasons, well, more or less, because in the case of Nietzsche, he was ready to marry his sweetheart, but she rejected him, and arguably we would have today no eternal return, no ubermensch, if uh, 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 Salome hadn't rejected uh, Nietzsche. Wow. None yeah. of that would have come to, to pass because all of that came out of his broken heart. Wow. Wow. Bernardo, what, what do you say to my fiance who, who, who would say, you guys, you're just 
so why why not just you know enjoy the music and eat your sandwich and enjoy it and just have a good time and why why bother thinking so deeply about these things you two what would you say to her my fiance my latin fiance this is how nature wants to express itself through her mm. and that's valid the error is the induction to say that everybody should live like they feel they have to live mm. so for them nature wants to experience immediacy uh, relationships warmth and beauty and that's a very southern european tone mm. you know the southern european love for beauty mm. uh, is notorious as notorious as the northern european love for truth mm. Mm. and 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 plato said they are the same right mm. beauty is truth yeah. that's plato right there you know? and people say and the rest of philosophy is a footnote to plato mm. so at least this is indeed right there beauty and truth and 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 those have different forms of expression i certainly have an appreciation for beauty but my my spirit, if I use the word metaphorically, is definitely a northern European spirit uh, and I'm much more oriented towards truth. Yeah. The beauty for me is, is my off time. Yeah. But for people with a different disposition, which I think is equally valid to ours, uh, truth is the off time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, beauty is life. Yeah. Life is beauty. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's wrong. No. It's just another facet. Yes. Yes, it's I'm so fascinated by this. Bernardo, we've, we've touched on a little bit of sociology, which really lit me up. It was it tickled me. Um, and, and if my following question is too personal, I completely understand that you can just reject it. Uh, but but I I find myself curious about your politics. Um, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned you made a reference to Trump and you were like, don't make any assumptions about me. And so. Oh, yeah. This is my curiosity, but if it's too personal, I completely understand. No, look, I, I don't, it, it, if I acknowledge a label of liberal, then I would immediately acknowledge the label of conservatism. Or I would reject both. But I, my politics is, and that's what, that's my beef against uh, the political wisdom of these days, everything has to be classified according to some label everything has to go into one drawer mm -hmm. as if our problems were so simple that we could categorize the solutions into two sides mm -hmm. I, I am afraid that that's not even remotely plausible or realistic our problems are way too complex for us to classify approaches to the solution in terms of this or that this versus that uh, i think if one is thoughtful one is either both liberal and conservative or neither. I prefer neither, <laughs> but a lot of people would uh, see me issuing certain opinions or reasoning in a certain way uh, if they are close to me in my personal life and they would say, Bernardo is a conservatist. And a whole lot of people would see me acting in a different context or speaking about other things and they would say, Bernardo is a complete liberal. He's out there sticking his neck out for the rights of the LGBT community. How do you call somebody like that? He's a liberal. Yeah, but Bernardo is also a Jungian. <laughs> and a Jungian honors uh, those archetypal templates that have governed human life since time immemorial. So Bernardo is a conservative. I, I like that you're not a postmodernist. I find that so refreshing. Uh, I, I certainly am not a postmodern relativist. No, Thank I God. think our lives are grounded in nature, and I don't think uh, nature has changed appreciably in the few thousands of years of human history. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have solid grounds yes. to stand on. Yes. So, uh, so my politics is one that would be unrecognizable if described in only a few words. You could only have an idea of my politics if you would have a whole set of examples of what my positions are on different issues. Only then you could begin to have a smell of my politics. It's not something I can convey like in a corral into a simple statement based on labels. And I think, and, and maybe even arrogant, I think it's a great error to try to classify things into well-known categories in politics because it makes us thoughtless. It hides all the nuance, subtlety and complexities of the problems we face from us. 
and we literally become innocent and stupid. And then uh, uh, Jim uh, Hillman, James Hillman, the great psychologist, you know, uh, who died uh, 10 years ago, he used to talk of um, the American love for innocence. Yeah. Uh, and he used America as an example because he, he was American, so he we would only talk about his, his country. But that love for innocence is more widespread than, than we admit to ourselves. It does not restrict itself to America. And it's the idea that it's good to think simplistically. Mm -hmm. It's good to think in absolute categories, like there are good people and there are bad people. And the good people are only good and the bad people are only bad. Mm -hmm. that, that's how a child thinks. Once you mature and you have experience, you realize that there are many more nuances to this. That things are not always that clear. There is a lot more complexity. But uh, we have elevated this love of innocence to the level of a social value. It's good to be an innocent adult, to be an adult who still thinks in terms of good people are only good and bad people are only bad, and it's the good versus the bad. So a 65-year-old thinking like that, who we'll hate to you. You're on the right path. I mean, this is ridiculous. It, it, this is like a total denial of maturity. It's not okay to be immature. Like, it's totally. not okay. It's inevitable as a phase of life, but it's not okay to fall in love with imma immaturity and elevate that to a value. And that's what we are doing. So I completely agree with what everything you just said there. And I, but I see another impulse in Europe that I see as per, not maybe not equally dangerous, but also problematic. And that is the inability to take a stand for something that you always see both sides of everything that you can't just slam your fist in the table sometimes and say god damn it i'm not okay yeah. with this and, and that that's a huge problem yeah it's a lack of spine yeah and, uh, and then, you know this uh, there there's there's the scent of what you just said is in um, postmodernism, uh um in relativism the idea that uh, you know nothing nothing is absolute because that, that's the other side of the coin to think only in terms of absolutes is as bad as to say nothing is absolute we stand on no ground everything is relative so and then you quickly go into total moral relativism yeah you quickly go into uh, having no uh, ontology nothing's true and from there, it's a very quick, slippery, slippery slope towards uh, nihilism, towards so, meaninglessness. Because if nothing's absolute, if everything is relative, if everything is made up by ourselves, like post-structuralism, everything is made up by ourselves. And you're correct in associating this with streams of European thought, particularly French. Um, and not to discriminate the French, it, it was just louder on, on that part of European culture. Um, I think it's an equal danger. It's not the other to, side of the yes. coin. Yes, not to mention that to say that everything is relative is an absolute claim. <laughs> yeah, indeed. indeed. You know, it's like, yeah. it there's no consistency at all there. Um, okay, this makes sense. So you're right that the only way to have any more clarity is to be, be issue specific. Do you have any concerns at all about the about the authoritarian impulse that we're seeing more and more in the world uh, in terms of um, a corrosive force when it comes to democracy. Look, most philosophers throughout history uh, will tell you that uh, democracy is a very problematic way of government. It has fatal weaknesses. But most of them will immediately rush and say, but we do not know anyone that's better. <laughs> We do not know a better way of government because the alternatives have been tested. And although some have worked for quite a while, ultimately they have all proven catastrophic. Um, and the, the democracy experiment is an ongoing experiment. It has been tried in Greece, in At well, in Greece, in Athens, in Attica, one province of Greece. And it had a disastrous end. Athens was governed by a democracy during the 30 year long war against Sparta. Uh, which the Athenians lost, and, uh, and that was probably because of their form of government, which was a democracy. Well, democracy between quotes, because more than half the population of Attica was made of slaves, <laughs> and those didn't vote, <laughs> um, and women didn't vote either, so democracy, democracy between quotes, but um, the inefficiencies of democracy arguably led to the loss of Athens in the war against Sparta, which was not a democracy, 
It was an aristocratic uh, society, a war, uh, warrior society. So the ex we had that experiment very early on, two and a half thousand years ago. It failed. Now we are trying that experiment again. Uh, it's as old as the French Revolution and the American uh, independence. So it's as old as the late 18th century. Uh, that means it's a little more than 200 years old now. Uh, 240, maybe 50 years old. It's it's a kid. Yeah. It, it, didn't, it doesn't even walk yet. It's, uh, it's trying its first steps. It has been very iffy and shaky so far, but so far the experiment is still promising. There is no utter failure of the democratic experiment. The final result, the jury is still out. We will see. China is posing uh, a, a serious threat to it, which may be a legitimate threat uh, in the sense that, you know, history will tell what, what will have worked uh, best. Um, now, what's happening recently with populist movements and the re-emergence re of the confident authoritarian leader, um, it's happening in Russia. I think if, if you ask most Russians, they will say, well, let it continue because our lives are much better than they were during uh, the pseudo-democracy of, uh, of um, Oh, his name escapes me now, the previous president, Boris Yeltsin. Gorbachev. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Uh, Yeltsin. Yeah. Uh. Um, and, and it was a drama. That was complete catastrophe for Russians at uh, the time of Yeltsin. Their lives went to hell very quickly. Um, why is this happening again now? I think it's because, you know, it's part of our collective shadow that uh, has always been there. It has never gone away. It's, it's, it rears its ugly head up from time to time. It has done that with the Nazis, uh, with the fa fascists of Italy, the Nazis in Germany. Um, um, even in places you wouldn't expect uh, this has happened. Now, I'm Dutch. Uh, um, just the other day, I watched the Dutch movie about how the Dutch reacted to the independence movement of Indonesia uh, just after the Second World War. And, uh, and it was a bloodbath. Uh, you know, what the Dutch did in Indonesia, it's something to be ashamed of as much as the Germans have something to feel ashamed of. Um, singling out the Germans, I think, is a profound historical injustice. No, you don't even need to look at history. Just look at that time, the early 20th century. I mean, Stalin killed more Russians in Russia than Hitler killed Jews in the entirety of Europe. Wow. But uh, nobody speaks of that. People talk about the Nazis, <laughs> not Stalinism. Um, wow. 20 million Russians probably were killed in the uh, gulags and uh, you know, sent to Siberia to never uh, be seen by family and friends again. Wow. So, this, this is a perennial thing in, in the collective human psyche. Jung spoke at length of this, the danger of the mass mind. Because when you think in terms of the mass mind, you lose that policing role that the ego can play or consciousness can play. Uh, you become purely instinctive again, and then you are vulnerable to those dark instincts that manifest themselves through collective thinking, mob, mob mentality. So th these people today, they are just playing on those forces, I think, that are part of who we, we, who we are. And they are always there. And they can be tapped on when convenient or when the circumstances allow. And right now, the circumstances allow because we have realized how much duped we used to be before social media, before the internet the way entire peoples would think, the tone of that thinking would be set by the editorial rooms of the major news organizations. And then the eight o'clock news would tell you how to think about the world, who the bad guy was, uh, what the good political move would be, what was fair, what wasn't fair, what had to be done, what couldn't be done. We were told that by the by mainstream uh, media, and we accepted that just as you know, a fact of reality. They are telling us the truth about it. Um, and everything was harmonious because there was no conflict. The tone was being set by, by those organizations and only rebel movements, niche rebel movements would defy that, like the hippies uh, tried to defy that, like uh, 
um, punk and new wave uh, tried to defy that later on in the early 80s. But they were considered niche and mm -hmm. you know, in the periphery of society. Uh, but now we realize that uh, the issues back then were much more nuanced than they seem to be based on what the media communicated to us. And we realized that we were maneuvered in certain directions. And this realization is true. That's yeah. the part that hurts the most. Yes. It is true. We have been manipulated all the way along. And now, because we are angry about that, and we don't want to be manipulated anymore, now we swing all the way to the other side and we become vulnerable as praise to the populist people who will be doing more manipulation yet. Yeah. They are doing worse than the mainstream media did, but they present themselves as the alternative to that. So they are preying on a valid insight that we have had collectively as a culture. It's a valid insight that we have been manipulated left and right. It is true. We were. The issues were much more complex, much more nuanced than they were portrayed to us. And we bought into that lie. We bought into that perspective. We thought Soviets ate little babies. I heard that as a kid. Huh? <laughs> I heard that as a kid. The Soviets are bad people because they eat little children. Well, I happen to have been married to a Russian for over 15 years. And I know they have a lot more in common to us than we would have a their think back in the 80s. Uh, so we had a valid insight that I think unscrupulous characters who are driven by a narcissistic search for power are now preying on to do the same 10 times worse to us because we are in a moment of vulnerability. I agree. I agree with you. And, and part of what makes us so vulnerable, isn't it? It's this innocent project, this seeing the world in black and white terms, like I'm exactly. good, I'm innocent. That makes us so vulnerable to manipulation. So because it kills thoughtfulness. Yes, it does. And if it kills thoughtfulness, if you kill thoughtfulness in yourself, you are a prime target for manipulation. For Indeed. somebody who will say, you have been deceived so far, let me tell you the real truth. Actually, yeah. that real truth is 10 times a deception, but we are vulnerable. That's right. And the bad is out there. It's the immigrants yeah. or whatever. It's not inside of me. It's yeah, out there. It's the other guys. Yeah, yeah. it's the other guys. Yeah. Yeah. Would, you, would you rather live in a society where everyone pitches in to the common good through taxation or, or, do, you prefer, or do you prefer more of a um, uh, libertarian type society where everyone tries to pull their own weight? I live in a country where I am taxed for more than half my salary at the source. So I don't even get to see more than half my salary in my bank account. And then I am taxed left and right, 20% on everything I buy. I'm taxed 1.25% a year on my savings, even if I don't make a penny on them. Oh my um, I am taxed for the right to rent my house and make a profit out of it, even though I live in my house and therefore I don't rent it and I don't make a profit out of it, I'm still taxed on the profits I could have made if I rented my house. That's the country where I live in. And I will tell you, I think taxation is unavoidable if we are to live in a decent, compassionate society. Well, yes, but it sounds like it's a little overboard in your country. Overkill, no? I will go out there and say in my country it's not because I see that money coming back in how my street is maintained, the facilities that are available to me, the conveniences I have, um, the healthcare system that, uh, that uh, secures my safety. I pay health insurance uh, many times more than a very poor person would pay, although the poor person pays too. Uh, but I land in the same hospital the poor person would land because there is no differentiation in the Netherlands. Um, we've made a decision in the Netherlands uh, prior to my birth um, that uh, when it comes to health care, making any differentiation is opening the door for allowing a certain type of person to die. And we figured that is completely unacceptable. And the only way to preclude this from ever happening is to make sure that there is never differentiation because then the people with power and money will make sure that the health system that they are depending on, never mind the poor guys depend on the same health system, but the powerful and rich people will make sure that that health system is good enough for them. Therefore, it will be good enough for everybody. Yep, yep. Or if it's not good enough for everybody, then it's not good enough for anyone. 
because it's the same for everyone. And, and that is done also on the basis of indirect taxation. I pay a lot more for private health insurance than a poor people pays for private health insurance. We are obliged by law to have health insurance. If you don't have money to have private health insurance, the government will give you the money for you to pay for your private health insurance. And then you have to pay taxes on the money you got from the government to the government. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, everything works as if you made your own money, even if the government is giving you money. And the idea is you're responsible for it. So although we are giving you money, you have to pay taxes to us on the money we are giving you, as if it were a salary paid by a company. I think that adds up. That adds up. It works for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, the Netherlands is a country of 17 million people, uh, a country with basically five cities three of which are merging together and becoming wow. one yeah so yeah three cities then yeah um, and it's completely flat um and it has a long history in which dutch people had to unite to save their lives from the sea to save their lives from the germans uh, uh you know we, we have a long history of, of having to cooperate at the broadest collective level in order to not die because you know, half the country is two or three meters below sea level. If tomorrow everybody stops maintaining the pumps that keep the land dry, uh, half the country is underwater and more than half the people. Um, so wow. it works for us given this set of circumstances, but in a continental country like the US with so much variability in values, in culture, in origin, in history, very little history compared to Europe, it, it may be a difficult thing to do i recognize that so i'm not going to sit here and say the whole world should be like the dutch because i know it's not realistic yes. the whole world has to find their own solutions which fit for their own local circumstances uh, but i'm happy with the dutch solution i pay taxes well i'm not say that i am never unhappy there are moments that i think i think like darn it's too much you know that you know I, I get knifed left and right you know um but uh, in general uh, I'm happy for it. I would go as far as to say that a universal income is a good thing to do. And I think the Netherlands should do that mm -hmm. uh, because it would pay back to us, people who are working. It, it would pay back. Yeah. It would stimulate creativity. It would stimulate the blossoming of society to a level that is unthinkable under strict capitalist terms because we all have to earn a living, uh, even for the basics. If some of us would say, you know, I don't want to sacrifice my diamond, my, my own natural feeling about how I want to contribute to the world, what, what, what nature wants to express through me, which may not earn me a living, but that's what nature wants to do. If I can accept the basic level of living, you know, in the most basic flat, one room apartment and healthy food, but nothing luxurious and good hospitals, if I can accept that, then I will want to express the creativity that wants to come through me uh, into the world, I think that would be a valid thing to do. I think we would see a blossoming of creativity, of entrepreneurial spirit, and I personally would be willing to pay for that. So if I've understood you, Bernardo, you, you seem to say that you want to be in a society where people pitch in for the common good, or, I mean, depending on the, the country itself. Uh, it, it varies if it's a bigger country, but... Generally, that is, you're good with that. And at the same time, you see room for, for rewarding hard work and, and excellence. Of course. I think uh, that's one of the good things of capitalism. I think we may have overdone that. I think it's uh, immoral for any one human being to have over a billion dollars. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't matter how much value you think you have created. It, it cannot justify... Uh, such an amount of concentration, I don't think that is justifiable. Uh, so we've gone too far with the mega billionaires, uh, I think. So something in the system would benefit from a correction. That's my own uh, personal opinion, because you cannot possibly spend a billion dollars, let alone a hundred billion dollars on yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, this is no longer rewarding to you. It's beyond the, the pale of personal rewarding for, for the value you created. What this now means is a concentration of power. So we are no longer talking about rewarding hard work or creativity. 
we are talking now about concentrating power. And that I think is, was not the spirit of the thing. The no. spirit of the thing was to reward you personally for the value you helped create. Yep. But you know, no human being can spend a billion. Don't tell me that a human being can actually spend and benefit from a hundred billion dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to live in many, many houses at the same time and ride many, many yachts, yachts at the same time. I mean, and, and, and I don't know, have many, many wives at the same time. And there are many things that have to happen, have to happen at the same time for you to be able to interpret that as personal reward for the value you created. So now we get into the realm of concentration of power. And I think that defies the spirit of this point of capitalism. So I think it, uh, uh, a, correction, uh, a correction would be, would be uh, yeah. appropriate uh, yeah. at this point. Um, I'm struggling to see your conservatism. I don't, I can't see it. <laughs> um, everything that uh, you would call conservative in Jung, you could say the same about me. I think we are driven by archetypal patterns of behavior. I think a religion is not insanity. I think it's an expression of something that uh, we are rooted into. I think we need a religious life. I think worship is a fantastic thing. I think liturgy is important. Mm -hmm. I think um, um, institutional support for religion is important. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that uh, I am spiritual but not religious is a sustainable attitude um because it it's too lonesome it, it religion comes from the latin religare to reconnect and you cannot reconnect if you're a lonesome spiritual but non-religious person where is your sense of community i think religion is a valid binding mechanism for a community i mean it doesn't get much more conservative than yeah you're right <laughs> yeah right no this is what i'm saying cool. yeah um i think uh, there is something to say about traditional values Yes. There is something to say about hard work. Mm -hmm. um, there is something to say about building a legacy in life. Mm -hmm. There is something to say about family. Um, yes. There is something to say about community. Yeah. Uh, if you go to big cities today, and I'm, I'm an urbanite because of my history, but uh, and I still live in a more or less urban region uh, in the Netherlands. I mean. Actually, I live in a very urban region. If you look at the a photograph of Europe at night, the most lit up part, <laughs> I'm bang in the middle of that triangle. But there are still people who live according to the old ways, only like five kilometers from, from where I am. The, you have this in Europe, you know, these old villages that have, people have been living there in that way for hundreds of years. And although they have a new vocabulary today and they, they ride tractors instead of, instead of horses, they're, they're the, the glasses through which they see the world is, are still the old glasses, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I like to go to a, to a place uh, in a village, I think eight kilometers from where I am, where they brew beer. And they have been brewing beer there for 800 years. That beer. Wow. And the vats are new because, you know, metal corrodes. <laughs> but the room is not. It's the same place. You know, it's the same bricks on the wall and it's the same recipe. Um, and And that sense of community, according, which lives according to the old values, I think we miss that terribly. We do not have that in urban regions. Mm -hmm. We have completely lost our sense of, sense of community, and we are trying to replace that with mm -hmm. social media, mm -hmm. which isn't a replacement. It isn't human. It, it has its value, but it, it, it's not fully human. Um, and I love to spend time in these villages where people speak, you know, old Dutch still that sometimes even have hard time understanding what they're trying to say. And they are just a couple of kilometers here down the road and they already speak uh, differently. And the way they relate to nature, um, the way they... Relativeren uh, is the Dutch word. I think in English, the translation would be the way they put things in perspective. Mm. Uh, they put everything in a broader perspective. If, uh, if the farmer, uh, if the, the corn is halfway grown and then there is a hailstorm and destroys his corn crop, he, if he were an urbanite, he would go in despair and, and start taking uh, antidepressants. But they don't. They relativize. They put it in perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, they realize that they are 
parts of a much bigger thing going on. And there, there is a sort of mute wisdom to that, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a calm way of relating. And, and that calmness, I think, arises from the fact that these people are not uprooted. They, they are living, they, they, they are in some way aware that they are the continuity of a way of life and a philosophy of life that has been going on for hundreds of years. They are the tip of the spear formed by all their ancestors and the ancestors of their ancestors. And in that sense, they are small, but very important because they are one in a long chain in which something has been conserved. Something of deep meaning has been conserved, a certain attitude towards the, wor the world. This is conservatism. Yeah, the essence, Literally. the real, the real essence of it. Yeah. Not the yeah, joke. And I think we miss that. Yes. I think uh, pure liberals are blind to this. They yeah. don't see this. Yes, I, I uh, agree with you. I went, to, I went to college at a place where to mention uh, femininity and masculinity as different things. Uh, you would be crucified for that. Seriously. So and that's a liberal school. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that goes way too far. I, I mean, nature has masculinity and femininity. These I, aspects exist. Yes. Now, it's fair to say that uh, a male doesn't necessarily have to express only masculine traits Absolutely. and no feminine traits. No, nobody said that. It's not etched in stone. The whole of right. nature is telling us that every individual has a bit of both. Yes. So one is more dominant, but every individual has a bit of both. But to deny that there, there is a difference between the two is just insane. It's insane. It's stupid. <laughs> it is. Just to say it's a pure social construct. I mean, it's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. So I'm with you that uh, a certain brand of uh, liberalism just goes far too far. Here they call it woke, wokeness. It's, it's this it's because you are woke. Yeah, you're you're you see the social injustices and. Oh, there are plenty of those. <laughs> There's well, no indeed, denying that. Indeed, there are. But the question is, what's most helpful in addressing them? Do we want to demonize white people for being white and males for being males? Is yeah, that, that's also insane. <laughs> is that going to rectify the social injustices or is that going to bring us together? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, okay. You see, that's why I would never accept the label liberal or the label conservative, yeah. because then I will know what I will be associated with on the other end of the scale as well. And <laughs> I'm, I'm far from that. I'm, yeah. I'm not, I don't want to touch that with a 10 foot pole either. I'm with you.